Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a completely new discovery of something a little bit unnerving. An idea known as gigantic super flares. Solar flares so extreme that they would actually dwarf anything we've ever witnessed and anything we've ever recorded for the past few hundreds of years. And this is something that was recently identified in one of the studies. Studies that, as always, you can find in the description below. And something that a lot of scientists believe would be extremely important for us to understand and potentially prepare for as well. A super flare of these proportions would be catastrophic to our society. But let's talk a little bit more about this, mostly because this is something that's basically completely new and something that nobody ever expected. And so what exactly do we know? Well, when it comes to our sun, we know that our sun generally seems to be a somewhat mild star. It doesn't really produce a lot of flares, it doesn't really create a lot of powerful emissions compared to some of the other nearby stars, and to some extent it seems to be a somewhat sleeping giant. It's calm and it's usually not awake. In contrast, our neighbor Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us, is what you would call a flare star. It produces an extremely large amount of very powerful flares, many of which would hypothetically strip the atmosphere of the planet in just a few million years, especially since many of the planets around a typical flare star or a red dwarf would be way closer to the star compared to a typical G-type star such as our sun. And many different studies came out in the last few years suggesting that many of these flares around red dwarfs would not really be hospitable to most of the life on those planets. With only one single study suggesting that in some cases these flares would only be affecting the polar regions of stars, not necessarily the planes of orbits where the planets are. But for the most part today we believe that a typical red dwarf is not really that hospitable because of these flares. And when it comes to flares from our own sun, the typical event we normally mention is the so-called Carrington event. The extremely powerful magnetic event caused by an extremely massive coronal mass ejection that occurred back in 1859 and ended up producing aurora in some really remote regions even close to the equator, while also causing a massive disruption to the early telegraph, even causing fire in several regions where the telegraphs were available. Even back then, the scientists were able to observe and document this magnetic storm, with the actual intensity being visible in this measurement right here that sort of goes way, way above the graph. And there's at least one paper you can find in the description that goes into more detail in regards to various aurora observed from Columbia back in 1859. But there were obviously some other geomagnetic storms as well, not as powerful, but powerful enough. There was one in 1921, there was one during the Second World War, and more recently there was one in 1989 that caused a severe blackout for several hours in the province of Quebec, essentially knocking out the entire electric grid of the province. But we've discussed a lot of this in one of the previous videos. The thing is, this is not at all what we're discussing today. Very recently the scientists identified something else, something even more extreme, something that's, to some extent, comparable to what you would have around a flare star. They've identified something they refer to as a geomagnetic superstorm. But before we talk about this, I also wanted to mention this particular study that recently came out as well, that actually identified at least one major problem with the current grid that could be easily affected by even a relatively minor geomagnetic storm. And this particular study focuses on the way we set up our cables that are used in the global communication network. Even though most cables are generally not going to be affected, Today, most of the communication is also done using what's known as a repeater, even when it comes to cables that run underneath the oceans. Today, the cables are more or less protected, but every 50 kilometers or so, there's normally a repeater that makes sure that the signal stays strong. These repeaters are extremely vulnerable to various geomagnetic disturbances. And in this particular study, the investigation determined that a geomagnetic storm would actually knock most of them completely out of service, which in effect would surprisingly create not a world wide web, but a kind of an isolated web. Basically, you would have regions completely isolated from one another, mostly because of the way that the network is set up. For example, certain regions like Asia, where the hub itself is in Singapore, and most of the locations are connected using shorter cables, would not really be affected as much, and in this case the network will survive and will create a kind of an Asia-Pacific wide web. 
And one of the main reasons why Singapore would not be affected as much is really because it's very, very close to the equator, where normally geomagnetic storms are at the weakest. But based on the C4 composition and a lot of other grounding effects, certain regions on the planet, like for example Northeast US, would be way more affected than other regions. And so in this particular case, if such an event were to occur, it would very likely isolate Europe from North America and North America from Asia. But this is of course a little bit off topic and just something I wanted to mention based on one of the very recent studies. But in this case we're talking about something similar to the Carrington event. However, both the Carrington event and a lot of other storms of the last 200 years are not even remotely comparable to what most likely happened in the year 775. Something that was at least 10 to possibly 100 times stronger in terms of geomagnetism. This particular solar superstorm was originally described in the paper you can find right here back in 2018, with the findings coming from various tree samples that contained a much more elevated levels of carbon-14 compared to carbon-12. In this case, by the way, this is exactly how carbon dating works. Normally, by comparing carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can determine the age of a certain sample. But in trees, sometimes certain rings have a much more enriched levels of carbon-14. And usually this implies that something extremely energetic happened somewhere out there. And though it could be potentially a supernova, a much more likely explanation is usually an extremely powerful solar flare. Or to be more exact, a coronal mass ejection that increases the amount of radiation and amount of magnetic particles reaching the planet, which then creates the geomagnetic storm. By the way, the reason why there's an elevated levels of carbon-14 is because carbon-14 is generally produced through the interaction of upper atmosphere with a lot of very powerful particles, such as galactic cosmic rays or very powerful solar rays that first produce nitrogen-14, which then turns into carbon-14, which then is captured by the plant and becomes part of the carbon cycle. But once in a while, scientists discover these unusual carbon-14 spikes. And this one in 775 is one of the biggest ever found. This particular spike, or this particular event, was so powerful as a matter of fact, that it sort of acquired its own name. Today it's known as the Miyake event. Named after Fusa Miyake of Nagoya University, who originally identified these unusual observations. But when the scientists found this, they thought this would be some sort of an extremely rare, ultra-rare event. Possibly once in maybe 10,000 years, maybe once in 100,000 years. Something that our sun doesn't really go through a lot. And that's, of course, until this recent paper. It identified two more of these Miyake events in the last 10,000 years. Specifically about 7,000 and 9,000 years ago with both of these events just as powerful as the original Miyake event from 775. And what this of course implies is that, well, at least three of these extremely powerful solar emissions, or these very powerful geomagnetic storms, hit planet Earth in the last 10,000 years. Once again suggesting that these events are way more frequent than any of the scientists believed when they first identified this a few years ago. And since this implies something that's 10 to 100 times more powerful than the Carrington event, these types of geomagnetic superstorms would be completely devastating to our society. Moreover, we actually don't even know what kind of damage they would cause. At the moment, we don't even have basic understanding of smaller geomagnetic storms. We don't know how much damage even a smaller event would cause to our extremely interconnected society and civilization. And so trying to understand what exactly happened and how to prevent this would be extremely important for us. But I'm sure some of the future studies will most likely discuss this in more detail and possibly identify some dangers and some solutions. To me personally though, what was more interesting is to discover, well, how exactly do we know that this was from the sun and not from some sort of a supernova or some other energetic event, such as a, I don't know, a gamma ray burst or some other unusual event. Well, technically, it could be a nearby supernova, but because we generally know the frequency of these events in the nearby space, and we know most of this from studying other galaxies, scientists today do not think that this is possible. They don't think supernova happened frequently enough to be able to produce three of these events with the effects observable on planet Earth. In this case, the effects from the Sun are just way, way more likely. And there's at least one study you can find in the description that establishes, without a doubt, that the 775 event was most likely a coronal mass ejection that created an extremely powerful geomagnetic storm. 
At the same time, to make this point even stronger, scientists generally compare different samples from different regions, and here they don't just look at trees. They also collect a lot of ice core samples and study the composition of various gases inside of them. So just like the trees accumulate in carbon-14, a typical ice core will also accumulate isotopes known as beryllium-10 and chlorine-36. And so by measuring the amounts of isotopes compared to the more stable elements, and by then comparing this to ancient samples from various tree rings, we can start establishing various patterns in regards to the amount of radiation the planet was receiving and specifically types of cosmic radiation that changes compounds into other compounds, and so in this case enriching the atmosphere in carbon-14 and beryllium-10. And also when it comes to tree ring samples, generally the scientists have already collected enough to sort of establish a timeline from the past 12,000 years or so. And so both the tree rings and the ice core samples in this case contain enough data to establish these three very powerful events. Interestingly enough, Neither the tree rings nor the ice cores contain the Carrington event, and this actually suggests only one thing. Carrington event was probably extremely mild in comparison to these gigantic super flares or super coronal mass ejections that caused extremely powerful geomagnetic storms. And there's also at least one paper that even suggests that ancient Chinese astronomers witnessed a lot of these aurora during the event in 776 which once again confirms that this was some sort of a geomagnetic storm. And so in the end, what does all of this mean? Well, for one, it suggests that our planet seems to be once in a while affected by extremely powerful geomagnetic storms. At least three of them happened in the last 10,000 years. Moreover, at least 80% of data is still not really fully analyzed, suggesting that even more of these events could be hiding in some of the tree rings which also suggests that these events could be much more frequent than we originally thought. And also means that our sun is not a sleeping giant after all. It does once in a while wake up and wakes up with an extremely powerful geomagnetic storm. But how likely are we to experience this in, I don't know, in the next 100 years or so? Well, when it comes to Carrington events, the scientists today believe that there's about 12% chance that we're going to experience a Carrington event in the next 10 years with the chance obviously increasing the more we wait. But when it comes to these extremely powerful magnetic storms, we just don't really have enough data yet. They could happen in the next 100 years, they could happen in the next 500 years, or they could happen maybe in the next few thousand years. Because we currently identified only three of them, there is just not enough data. But based on the data we have right now, we should be okay for at least a thousand years from now. Nevertheless, considering how powerful this would be and what effects it might actually have on our society, studying this and trying to analyze this in more detail is probably one of the most important things we can do right now in order to preserve our current civilization and to try to prepare for a potential geomagnetic storm that could completely disrupt our way of life. And so these geomagnetic storms, even though we sort of got lucky with them in the last few decades, might happen anytime now. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this relatively recent paper that makes a somewhat unusual and somewhat exciting suggestion. The suggestion that our solar system seems to be in the middle of a really really large magnetic tunnel. The tunnel that we seem to be flying through, but not really in the way that you see in the simulation here. Here we're actually going across the tunnel, mostly because it was probably produced a long time ago by a lot of different events. So let's talk a little bit more about this and also discuss the idea behind this and if it actually has any merit. But let's start right here in the fish tank. So as a fish, you're probably not really aware about where you live in. As a matter of fact, even if fish were somewhat intelligent, they would probably not actually be able to tell the shape of their fish tank or be able to understand what sort of an environment is around them simply because it's very, very difficult to see the outside from within. Similarly, here on planet Earth, and even in the solar system, it is very, very difficult for us to see our surroundings. So, for example, it took us a while to figure out what the shape of our galaxy is, and it's only recently we realized our galaxy is not entirely flat. It seems to have unusual formations and somewhat unusual deformations, including unusual ripples and, of course, the folds that you see in the simulation right here. But we've discussed a lot of these discoveries in the last few years as essentially the scientists made these discoveries. And it shouldn't really come as a surprise if we discover something entirely different and something that was always there but we just never noticed it. 
which is more or less what happened in this particular study from University of Toronto, with the scientists realizing that some of the features we've been observing in radio waves might actually be connecting in a kind of a tunnel-like formation. And it just so happens that we're sort of in the middle of this particular tunnel. Okay, so let's take baby steps. This is the Milky Way from planet Earth as it appears to us in visible light. Here's what it sort of looks like in radio light. In the last few years, specifically in the last decade, the radio astronomy sort of exploded. There is a tremendous number of various very powerful telescopes constantly scanning the skies. And a lot of new mysteries have already been discovered by a lot of these various radio telescopes. As a matter of fact, most of the modern astronomical mysteries, for the most part, usually come from radio telescopes, not really from a lot of other observations. And so when it comes to astronomy, we're definitely sort of in the golden age of radio astronomy. So here is the same image, but this time in radio waves. If you were to sort of start zooming in at some of these formations in more detail, you would start discovering a lot of different formations in a lot of different parts of the sky, such as, for example, the Centaurus A galaxy you see right here, or various objects in the Cygnus area. But the origin and the general formation of some other objects is still more or less mysterious. One of these objects is right here, known as the North Polar Spur. It's actually visible in a lot of different frequencies. This is from the Erosita, this is in the X-rays. And you can see that this large formation here, that's also the same North Polar Spur. It seems to be a pretty large object, and it seems to be about 500 light years away from us, but what exactly made it is not really known to us. And generally, there are quite a lot of different formations whose origin is still not really known. For example, there is another region known as the Fan region that you see right here. And a lot of these errors are pointing at some of the other unusual formations, different loops and different spurs. Now, today we believe that in most cases they were probably produced by very powerful explosions. So it's quite likely that most of them probably came to be as a result of some sort of a supernova or some kind of a similar very powerful event. But the thing is, by looking at all of this from planet Earth, all of this sort of seems more or less isolated and to some extent more or less disconnected. In other words, the connection between these objects does not seem to be apparent. But this particular answer wasn't really satisfying for the scientist behind this paper, Jennifer West, who as you can see in this picture is definitely wearing her hard hat with a style. Somehow she had the hunch that there was a connection between some of these objects. And so by using various computer models and by essentially trying to imagine all of this in three dimensions, her team realized that a lot of this might actually just look like this simply because of what's happening around us. It's as if all of this was tunnel only visible in radio light, with a lot of these formations simply being the result of our perspective, or essentially where we're looking at this from. And so in this case, imagine you're driving through a tunnel and imagine all these shapes that form around you. Okay, you don't really have to imagine it, you can always look at this image. So all of these different shapes that form inside the tunnel seem to be kind of similar to what we see around us as well. The fan region right here, the North Polar Spur, and a lot of other formations right here, morphologically seem to represent a kind of a tunnel-like structure that we seem to be located inside. But once again, the clarification here is that we're not moving through the tunnel in this way. We're not actually flying through the tunnel. In this case, it's a lot more likely that the tunnel is actually stationary and is moving with planet Earth across the galaxy. But some of these particles are definitely following the magnetic lines across the galaxy as well. Here is another way to try to imagine what all of this looks like. If our sun is right here in the middle, you can kind of see that there are quite a lot of these loop-like formations forming an almost tunnel-like structure, which from the top also might look something like this or something like this with the tunnel itself, as you can see, being approximately 1,000 light years in length. But even though this is referred to as the magnetic tunnel, it's not really the type of electricity and magnetism we have here on planet Earth. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even look like this. Here, the gas is really, really diffuse, and the actual magnetism is, for the most part, relatively weak. But it's still there and forms these very, very long filamental structures that sort of represent the magnetic lines of a typical galaxy, something that we've seen before in some of the other galaxies as well. Here's, for example, a radio and optical image of a distant galaxy known as NGC 4217. And notice how we were able to capture all of these different radio filaments or magnetic lines inside the galaxy itself. 
So it would not really be surprising that the Milky Way has these as well. And it just so happens that we seem to be located right in the center of one of these filaments. Or I guess almost at the center. There is still some gaps here and there. And so if our eyes could somehow see the radio waves, it's quite possible that we would be seeing something that might resemble this. Well, not really as perfectly circular though. We would definitely see the arc shapes, but maybe not the full circle. And in terms of what all of this is made out of, well, it's probably ionized hydrogen. A lot of hydrogen that was probably produced by a distant supernova a long time ago. Although the true origin of this is still obviously not known to us. For all we know, maybe a lot of these uh, filamental formations inside galaxies are formed in some other unusual way. But I guess what's really impressive about this particular study is the fact that since we've known about these structures since the early 60s, it's really really awesome to hear that after 60 years, someone realized that there seems to be a connection between all of them. Now obviously this is just the first study and a preliminary study that still needs to be confirmed by other scientists, but at the moment this looks really really promising. So far this paper received a lot of positive feedback and a lot of scientists are actually kind of surprised by this discovery. More importantly, it would be really nice to see a much better representation and a much better simulation of what's actually happening here based on modeling techniques that use a little bit more detail and have a little bit more data to work with. And doing this would be really important, mostly because a lot of this is based on mysteries we are currently trying to work out. The mysteries of the magnetic fields and various magnetic interactions inside typical galaxies. In one of the previous videos from not so long ago, we've discussed that some of these magnetic filaments have already been discovered very very close to the center of our galaxy, but now we seem to have found some of them even closer to us. And so the origin of these filaments and also what sort of effects they have on for example star formation would be really important to investigate. And so hopefully in the next few years, once we have more detailed maps and more detailed modeling, we'll start getting a better picture of what exactly is happening with this magnetic tunnel that we seem to be flying through. And since we know that in a lot of stars and also around various black holes, various magnetic filaments play a really important role in delivering massive amounts of material into, for example, a star or a black hole, and because we also know that a lot of massive planets usually form in a very similar manner as well, trying to understand the exact purpose of these filaments would be pretty important in understanding the way that galaxies evolve and the way that they grow as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the new discoveries coming out of Hubble Telescope in regards to the gas giants of our own solar system, the so-called Grand Tour of the Solar System. And this is actually something that Hubble has been doing for the past few decades, and something that has helped us understand how a lot of these planets transform, and how they actually change with various seasons and throughout the year. But because, as you might have heard, Hubble is once again in trouble and is currently operating in the safe mode, a lot of this data was originally collected a little bit earlier. And interestingly, this is actually the third time Hubble is officially in the safe mode this year. This time the problem was because of something known as the synchronization messages that were not going through. And in the last few weeks the scientists might have actually fixed this problem, but currently the telescope is still in the safe mode. Anyway, we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos, for now let's just focus on the discoveries. And in this case, the scientists refer to this as the Grand Tour of the Solar System. The term that was originally proposed back in the 70s, when the Voyager probes got to visit every planet out there and allowed us to understand what happens around these gas giants, uncovering some really interesting secrets in the process. And so since then, a lot of the data, a lot of the pictures, were actually taken by telescopes like Hubble, and they still help us understand what happens on the surface of these various planets, helping us understand how these planets change in time, and what sort of effects they have on their surface. And so a few days ago, NASA has officially released even more images of these planets, continuing its annual tradition of this so-called Grand Tour by basically taking extremely detailed pictures of these four beautiful planets, which allowed the scientists to see how they transformed over time, comparing them to some of the ones we've had from a few years ago. And just like with a lot of other NASA data, this one is of course available publicly, and you can technically download all of these images in their raw format from the program known as Outer Planets Atmospheres Legacy, also known as OPAL. And so as you can see here, you can basically go through the data product and download anything you want. 
with each cycle and each planet available from the link in the description below. And overall, this is a pretty interesting investigation for one simple reason. These worlds seem to transform pretty much every single year. Every time NASA comes back and looks at these monsters once again, the atmosphere changed just a little bit. For example, sometimes Jupiter acquires new storms, sometimes the actual atmosphere changes colors, and sometimes something unusual happens somewhere on the surface. And so, in the last few decades, the scientists have discovered quite a lot of different mysteries that even today are somewhat difficult to answer. And this is of course mostly because these are gas giants with a lot of different gases interacting at all times and a lot of them reshuffling and moving around and also moving on top of an extremely hot compact core and thus producing a lot of unusual effects. With the dynamics of these various effects not really understood even today. But it's definitely something astronomers are trying to figure out and trying to solve just to understand how all of this works on other planets as well. So let's start with Jupiter, the most massive and most influential planet in the solar system. And a lot of these new discoveries about Jupiter are mostly coming from this one photo taken in November of 2021. The photo that uncovered a few new storms near the Jupiter's equator. And at the same time, strangely enough, the Jupiter's equator seems to be changing color, with the region around the equator right here now becoming deep orange. And at the moment, the researchers are not entirely sure how to explain any of this. In all of the previous images, this area is usually either white or beige in color. It's never really this deep orange. And so, even though the scientists expected more clouds here and a much different color, this is basically what Jupiter looks like right now. At the same time, they've discovered a few new storms that you see right here that are usually referred to as barges which are these very unusual cyclone-like storms that once in a while appear on the surface but then disappear very quickly as well. Their actual origin and the way they operate on Jupiter is also not really understood today. And they also seem to have slightly different properties and they definitely have different appearance, which means that they probably have slightly different physical properties and potentially even have slightly different origins. And then there are also some discoveries from the Great Red Spot, where Hubble recently discovered that the winds here are actually speeding up and moving a little bit faster than before. And so even the Great Red Spot is transforming and becoming slightly different from what it used to be a few decades ago. The next on the list is Saturn, and the pictures of Saturn are from September of 2021. Here's actually what this beautiful shot looks like, and you can almost see right away the unusual patterns that Hubble has recently discovered. These unusual, extremely colorful bands, in the northern hemisphere of the planet that seem to have quite an extreme change in color, quite dramatically different from the previous year or from the year before. So you can kind of see the transformation in just a few years. Those other pictures were from 2019 and 2020. And so one of the possible explanations here is that, well, the northern hemisphere is just undergoing its seasonal changes, where now it's technically early fall. Which, in some sense, is kind of ironic because we know that fall on Earth is also usually very colorful. On the other hand, the southern hemisphere is going through its winter and you can kind of see that it's sort of bluish in color. Oh, there was also kind of bluish in some of the previous photos as well. Either way, what this shows us is that Saturn seems to have very definitive seasons that change its atmosphere, making it look very different depending on the year. The next on the list is Uranus, the planet known for spinning on its side. This image was taken in October of 2021, and it does an amazing job at presenting the northern pole, which is literally pointing almost directly at us right now. But here it's currently springtime, and because of the increase in the ultraviolet light hitting the surface of the northern pole, the UV light that's coming from the sun of course, it's essentially causing the entire north pole to brighten in color normally it would be more bluish. Although the actual mechanics of this are not really well understood. One explanation suggests that it's probably because of the changes in the atmospheric opacity because of the methane here. And as the methane interacts with the UV light, it might allow some of the other aerosols and some of the other gases to move higher to the top, changing the colors. Although interestingly, one thing that has not changed on Uranus in a very long time is this border right here. It's actually remained stable at approximately 43 degrees latitude for an extremely long time. And at the moment, it's not really understood how any of this works either. And then the last on the list is Neptune, the farthest planet from the sun. And here's that image that Hubble took in September of 2021. 
And one of the major discoveries here is in regards to the mysterious dark spot on Neptune, the spot that's barely visible right here. And unlike on Jupiter, these dark spots only last for a few years. But this particular dark spot has actually survived for a little bit longer, and surprisingly it has now reversed its motion, and in a recent image it's shown to be moving away from the equator while at the same time also showing us that the northern hemisphere has also changed colors, it became a little bit darker than before. And at the same time there's also another unusual darker circle right here in the southern pole, which suggests that something is happening on both poles of this planet, but once again, nobody really knows what's going on. And by the way, the reason that both Uranus and Neptune are sort of bluish in color is really because of the presence of methane in their atmosphere. Unlike other gas giants that are generally made out of a lot of hydrogen, the presence of large amounts of methane here ends up absorbing a lot of the red light, and thus releasing a lot of blue light for us to see, with the light scattering being very similar to how it works here in the Earth's atmosphere. It's known as the Rayleigh scattering. And so that's the natural of current observations, and some new mysteries for us to talk about in some of the future videos. For now, that's all we know about these planets and how they changed in the last year, and chances are next year these images are going to be very different from before as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the heliosphere of our solar system. The region that's produced by our sun as it travels across the galaxy and as it sort of interacts with a lot of different plasma out there outside of our own solar system. But specifically we're actually going to be talking about this right here the actual representation of the heliosphere as it was recently recreated by using one of the most amazing satellites that is currently orbiting our own planet. The satellite that you see right here known as IBEX. But let's talk a little bit more about what we know about the heliosphere and also how all of this was discovered because the actual method here is sort of mind-blowing. First of all, you can learn more about IBEX using the link in the description below. This is a satellite that has been operating for over a decade now and has produced quite a lot of data. And the satellite itself is in a very interesting orbit around our planet where it can sort of detect a lot of different things coming from the heliosphere and is specifically looking for what's known as neutral hydrogen. This neutral hydrogen, or ENA as it's known, which stands for energetic neutral atom, is produced by the helio sheath that you see right there. Or in other words, it's produced around this region. Now the way that it's produced is when the emissions from our sun, specifically very highly energized emissions, collide with the plasma of the interstellar space and start creating the neutral hydrogen atoms that sometimes return back to the inner solar system. Now in the past we've already discovered there are a lot of really interesting things happening in this helio sheath, which is this region right here, right between the heliosphere and the interstellar space. And at this region, because of the pressure from the solar wind, it kind of creates a very thick and somewhat dense region of very active plasma. This has been detected by the Voyager probes as they traveled away from the solar system, and they discovered that there's a lot of really energetic activity going on here, including some really interesting formations that sort of form these unusual bubble-like structures inside this region. And so by being able to identify where this region is around the sun, we're able to kind of create a three-dimensional map that allows us to define the heliosphere of our solar system. Now if you're still confused about the heliosphere and what it represents in the solar system, I think the easiest analogy is using a sink and the running water here. If we look at what all of this looks like, with the sun being represented by the point where the tap water hits the sink, you've probably seen that there's a kind of a fast flow in this region, and then there is a lot of slow flow past that. Now this obviously represents the interstellar space, and the helio sheath, including the termination shock, is the region right between the fast flow and the slow flow with the fast running water right here representing the solar emissions and various types of solar flares coming from our sun as it bombards the rest of the solar system using its energy. And so once you understand the analogy, it sort of starts making sense in terms of uh, the solar system as well, except that instead of water, here we're talking about various emissions of plasma, specifically ionized hydrogen and of course electrons as well, something that we usually refer to as the solar wind. But something interesting happens when the solar wind hits the heliosheath, or essentially the limit of the heliosphere. 
it converts some of the charged particles into neutral particles, and those neutral particles then make their way back into the solar system. Hypothetically, we can detect them and using this calculate or at least predict an overall shape of the heliosheath and the heliosphere. If we go back to this analogy, we're essentially detecting some of the water particles that then bounce off the termination shock or the heliosheath and slowly move back to the region where we're located where we can kind of see them. And then if we're somehow able to time the return journey of these particles, we should be able to calculate or to at least build the image of what this entire region might actually look like, which is precisely what the scientists were able to do by using IBEX. By using approximately 10 years of data between 2009 and 2019 and observations from the solar activity, and then by collecting the data of the returning neutral particles, the scientists were able to then work out how long it took for particles from different directions to make their way back to planet Earth. And essentially this way they were able to work out the overall structure of the heliosheath. Another way of looking at this is echolocation. And so just like bats use echolocation to map a cave for example, by orbiting around planet Earth and by collecting the data from these neutral particles, IBEX was able to map the entire region in three dimensions around our planet. Which of course by association meant that it was able to map the region of the solar system as well. And it created this image by dividing the region into 56 macropixels, which more or less covered the entire three dimensions around the sky. And by combining the 10 years of data, they were able to create this. So this is right now the best representation in three dimensions of what the heliosphere of our solar system sort of looks like. Now obviously because it only used 56 pixels, it's not a very accurate or a very precise representation, but chances are it will only get better with time as we collect more and more data. And because this is the first time that it's ever been done this way and the first time that such a 3D map was created, this of course is just the beginning and chances are that in a few years from now, we'll have something as beautiful and as detailed as this illustration you see right here, but in three dimensions. Now the way that they essentially made this work is by observing the increases in intensity coming from a typical solar flare. So for example, let's just say a major solar flare occurred and was detected on planet Earth. The scientists then have to wait a few years before the solar flare interacts with the heliosheath and starts returning these neutral particles to our planet again. And then after a couple of years, if they start detecting the increase in neutral particles coming from a certain direction, it means that the solar flare has just bounced off from the heliosheath and is now coming back to planet Earth. And so far, according to this technique, it looks like the minimal distance to the heliosheath from our planet, which is this right here, is roughly around 120 astronomical units, which is about four times the distance of Pluto to the Sun, or around 30 times the distance to Jupiter from Earth when it's closest to planet Earth. But on the opposite side, it seems to extend to over 350 astronomical units, which already means that it's at least three times away as far away, but chances are even farther because it sort of represents the limit of this particular technique. It's almost impossible for the scientists to try to use the echolocation at farther distances in this direction right here. And so it's not really clear how long the actual tail extends to. And so the heliosphere on this side could actually be extending way farther than we sort of imagine right now. But the distance of 120 AU is exactly the same distance where Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 we're experiencing these unusual observations that we now refer to as the heliosheath. Although to be more exact, it was actually a distance of about 119 and 121. And because of this, we know that this region is not very smooth. It's very likely extremely bumpy. And it's probably also filled with a lot of different turbulence and a lot of different activity we still don't really understand. But because this technique proved to be quite successful at creating these maps, and because IBEX is still operational and usually detects about 500 different neutral particles per day, there's a huge chance that in the next decade, if it's still operational, the map might increase in quality and of course increase in resolution. What started as 56 pixels, which is what you see right here, might increase to hundreds, thousands, and possibly even millions of pixels. And this of course means that we might create a map showing us an extremely detailed picture of what the entire solar system and the heliosphere actually looks like. For now though, because of the current limitations in resolution, this is the best we can do. Although even this is already quite impressive. 
But anyway, it's always great to learn more details about our sun and our solar system and discover new details or see new maps that we've never seen before. So I'm sure there will be more follow-ups to the study and more maps coming in the next few years. Hello Infopress and this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about the official confirmation of the discovery of the farthest object in the solar system. The object jokingly known as Far Far Out. Not just Far Out, Far Far Out. And there's a reason for that. That's actually related to a video I made I think about two or possibly three years ago. Back then, the three famous astronomers Scott Shepard, David Tholen and Chad Trujillo were working in the Hawaiian Observatory and discovered this object known as 2018 VG18. It was actually the farthest object discovered back then, it was approximately 128 astronomical units away from the Sun, and because they didn't have a good name for it yet, they decided to call it Far Out. But on that same week when the team was about to present their discovery, I believe there was a snowstorm or some sort of an event where the team was not able to present on that particular day. And because of this, they decided to just stay at home and just go through some additional data. To their surprise, they discovered something even farther. The Far Far Out. The object that was a few astronomical units farther away than Far Out. And this was of course an extremely lucky discovery, but it of course also shocked the scientists. And so it took about three years to finally confirm the distance to this object and to finally confirm what it probably is. The object currently designated as 2018 AG37 is roughly around 133 astronomical units away from the Sun, which is about four times the distance of Pluto to the Sun. But interestingly, unlike some of the other so-called trans-Neptunian objects, this one has a very peculiar orbit. Its lower point, its so-called periapsis, ends up crossing Neptune's orbit pretty much every 1000 years or so. In other words, it comes to within about 29 astronomical units away from the Sun. And that's something we kind of have never really seen before, but would also explain why it has such an eccentric orbit and why it's so far away from everything. It most likely was in orbit of Neptune at some point or possibly was some sort of a larger object passing nearby and it essentially got kicked out by Neptune when sometime in the past, possibly billions and billions of years ago, it probably passed relatively close to Neptune, although maybe not as close as I'm making it right here, with its orbit shifting dramatically and getting this very, very eccentric orbit that it has today. Now, this also means that at some point, very likely in the next few billions of years or possibly even sooner than that, it's going to come close to Neptune once again, close enough to have its orbit changed. And this might mean that it could get kicked out of the solar system or it could end up getting closer to the solar system or possibly even become a new satellite or a new moon of Neptune. This is what we believed happened to the Neptune's moon known as Triton. Today we believe that Triton was very likely captured in a very similar fashion. And though we know very little about Triton itself other than the pictures that were taken by the Voyager 2 probe, today we understand that Triton very likely is one of these captured trans-Neptunian objects. Which naturally also raises the question of, are these objects related? Did they originally come from the same larger body, or are they just two different objects that experienced the same fate? Or somewhat similar fates. One of them became the moon, but the other actually got kicked out to some extent and acquired a very eccentric orbit. There's also a major difference between them, and the difference is of course the size and the mass. Here's how Triton compares to our own moon. But here's how Triton compares to this newly discovered object far, far out. This is only about 400 kilometers in diameter. In other words, this is probably not even a dwarf planet. In some sense, this is a minor planet or a very large asteroid, but depending on its composition, it's most likely not even spherical, probably resembling something like Vesta, which is larger in size than this particular object as well. But why did it take scientists so long, basically several years, to confirm the existence and the distance to this object? Well, it's really because of the distances involved here and also because of how slowly it moves across the night skies compared to everything else we have. It took several years of observations, including telescopes in Hawaii and in Chile, specifically these ones right here known as Gemini North and Gemini South, to collect the data on the motions of this object to finally see it move just a little bit in order to calculate its orbit. And because it looks so tiny and so dim from the distance from planet Earth, 
and also because it moves so little across the night skies, equivalent to an angle of about 4 seconds per day, it means that a lot of observations and a lot of really accurate observations, specifically 9 separate observations, were required to find out what the orbit here is. Also establishing that in the next few hundreds of years, it's going to reach the farthest point of the orbit that's going to be about 175 astronomical units. But it's also important to understand that this object is not actually unique. We've discovered many such objects with very similar elliptical orbits, many of which do actually cross Neptune as well. But the more interesting types of objects are these so-called sednoids or sedna-like objects, whose orbits don't necessarily reach Neptune, but whose orbits are nevertheless elliptical as well. And these are the objects the scientists are currently trying to collect in order to try to find out if there is another planet, such as Planet 9, hiding somewhere on the outskirts of the solar system. Also, Sedna currently is in its closer part of the orbit. The orbit of Sedna, for example, is about 10,000 years long, or about 10 times as long, which means that it's going to reach much farther distances from the Sun. The current estimate puts the farthest point at 937 astronomical units, and that's basically 9 times as far away as the recently discovered Far Far Out. But at this point, in 2021, this is still a record holder. This is still the farthest object that we currently can see with telescopes. It is, however, not the farthest object that we are aware of. For example, there are several comets that we know exist when we've seen them in the past, and we know their distances are now much farther away. Not to mention three different spacecrafts from NASA that have reached these far distances as well. And so here, for example, you can kind of visualize all of this. Here's the Sun, here's Earth, this right here would be Pluto, this is Eris, the largest dwarf planet we know of, Sedna is currently right here, this is the far out object I mentioned in the beginning, and this is the newly confirmed far far out. Now the Pioneer probe is at a distance of about 128 astronomical units, which is somewhere right here, with the Voyager 2 being at 127, which is somewhere right before it. But the current distance of Voyager 1 is 152 astronomical units, so it's already farther away. We can't really see it, but we can still hear it communicate with us. And then we have the famous Great Comet of 1680. This is the comet whose orbit was calculated quite precisely, and with an orbit of about 10,400 years, it's currently somewhere around 258 astronomical units away from planet Earth. So that's roughly the double the distance of Far Far Out. And lastly, one of the most famous comets historically, the Caesar's Comet, also known as the Star of Caesar, that surprisingly occurred right after the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, is estimated to be at a distance of about 800 astronomical units away from Earth. But that's of course a somewhat inaccurate estimate because back then no one really precisely measured orbits of these objects. And so for now we can't really be certain what happened to this comet and where it currently is. What we can be certain about though is the distance to far far out and its current orbital parameters. Obviously in the future more objects similar to this will be discovered and a lot more objects will be identified with even more eccentric and possibly even more unusual orbits. For now though this is probably the most curious object we've found so far and the one that could help us understand how objects around Neptune interact with the planet and also interact with one another. More importantly, you might have actually found a sibling to Triton, the moon of Neptune. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're discussing not just one, but possibly two major resolutions to two mysteries of outer space. Or actually one of them is right here from the solar system. And in this case we're discussing this new study, that as always you can find in the description below, that use some really interesting computer simulations to discover what might have happened to one of the most iconic stars known as Fu Orionis, and what might have actually happened to the solar system back in the days as well. But to start, so what exactly are these mysteries? So the first one is from right here in the solar system, and it's actually sort of visible in this image. Although this one here is slightly more descriptive, what you're looking at here is known as the chondrules. These are tiny inclusions in a lot of different meteorites recovered in the last few decades, and in essence are these tiny tiny grains found in various types of meteorites, or roughly around 80% of all of the meteorites we've recovered so far, with the particles themselves most likely being formed in relatively hot temperatures in the early solar system. 
Specifically, it's believed that a lot of these represent tiny droplets that were molten in space with their average temperature of about 1000 to maybe 2000 Kelvin. And this was probably caused by some sort of a really, really powerful event that happened in the early solar system. And all of these particles then solidified, forming these chondrules we find in the asteroids and various meteorites. Which also means that these are most likely some of the oldest solid material in the solar system left from the formation itself. And because of the modern theories of planetary formation, today it's also believed that the majority of these unusual chondros are extremely important in understanding the initial development of all of the planets as well. But at the moment, nobody is absolutely certain on what exactly caused their production in the solar system. What's certain though is that they're formed by some sort of an extremely rapid flash event that produced a sudden burst of energy. Here, at least 1000 Kelvin is required to produce most of these particles that are roughly around a few micrometers to maybe a centimeter in size. And to date, the biggest explanations involved either some sort of a major event in the original cloud from which the solar system was created, so for example, some sort of a nearby supernova event that suddenly heated up all of this material to ridiculous temperatures, or some other unusual magnetic effect that was very likely extremely common in the early solar system, with the sun itself suddenly acquiring a lot of magnetism and thus increasing the consumption of matter and producing extreme amounts of heat. Or in other words, nobody is certain, nobody knows. But this paper, the paper that was just released a few days ago, makes a really good point and presents really solid evidence for what might actually have happened based on another mystery from 1936. The mystery of a star known as Fu Orionis with an older video somewhere right there describing this in a little bit more detail, that back in 1936 increased in brightness by roughly around 100 times for a period of about a year. And this was extremely difficult to explain because the scientists have um, never really seen anything like this before. Now the previous explanation that we've discussed in one of the previous videos involved the idea of some sort of an extreme magnetic event with the star essentially suddenly increasing its magnetic field and suddenly consuming a tremendous amount of matter around itself and thus producing a huge amount of radiation and increasing in brightness. Now this is not the only such star. As a matter of fact, Fu Ori is essentially a type of stars now. There are quite a lot of them that have been discovered in the last few decades. And today it's believed that the majority of the stars out there actually become this in the early formation of the star system itself. Or in other words, some scientists today believe that this is exactly how the stars actually grow and become bigger and bigger. These pre-main sequence stars, sometimes also known as the T Tauri stars, seem to actually form by suddenly absorbing a lot of matter and doing so at least 10 to maybe even 20 times during their existence. And so that previous study that I've discussed, I think about a year ago, suggested that basically even our sun grew in this way as well. And it's a very solid proposition, but it's not entirely clear if this is actually something that all of the stars do, and more specifically, if this is actually what happened back in 1936. And so the scientists in this recent paper decided to focus on something a little bit different based on some of the modern observations and some of the modern analysis of this star system. Turns out this is not a single star. About a year ago, it was discovered that turns out that this is two stars and there are clear signs of their interaction that seem to have happened relatively recently. This brighter object today is known as Fu Ori N and the less bright object here is Fu Ori S. Both objects are probably in their youth and are still growing and developing. But interestingly, the bright star here is the smaller of the two. This is about 1.2 masses of the sun. This is probably about half that, maybe even less. Yet it's brighter and seems to produce more energy. And that's actually a big mystery. It's really difficult to explain this based on modern observations from other star systems. And that same paper has also discovered clear signs of the interaction between the two stars. And since their distance is really not that far away from one another, it's very likely happened in the last hundred or so years. And so the scientists in this study realized that, well, maybe we can try to see what happens to these stars when they have a close passage and then see how their temperature changes overall. And you can find all of the resulting videos in the link in the description below by the original author. In a nutshell though, all of their simulations suggest one single thing. 
First of all, obviously there's a lot of disturbance going on between the two stars and they do disturb each other's planetary disk. But second of all, one of them becomes extremely bright extremely fast, with the brightness increasing by up to about 250 times. And interestingly enough, it's the smaller of the two stars, just like what we observe in the system known as Fu Ori. And that is sort of a telltale sign to what might have happened here back in 1936. That passage might have actually been the reason for why the star increased in brightness so suddenly, and the paper here describes how all this might have happened and what might have occurred. So here's what they think might have happened. During the passage of one of the stars through the disk of the other stars, the smaller star experiences a dramatic shift that seems to increase the accretion of all of the gas that used to orbit around it, and that's because the disk is disturbed. Something that surprisingly was observed in every single simulation involving two stars and a star that seems to have a relatively large disk around it. And in this case it's the secondary star that becomes really really bright while going through the disk of the primary star, capturing the material and then suddenly increasing a lot of the accretion around itself. And their simulations suggested that this can actually go on for up to about 100 years, something that we also are observing from the star system. But more importantly, that initial process of becoming extremely bright only happens in like a year or maybe two years, exactly what was observed in 1936, with the average temperature of the disk nearby becoming about 1500 Kelvin or so. And that is, once again, really important for that other first mystery we've discussed. The implication here is of course that maybe something very similar happened to the solar system in the first 10 million years of its existence, producing all of these chondrules we have in various meteorites that are otherwise somewhat difficult to explain. And actually one of the potential early explanations of this was the so-called Fu Ori process, but it was believed to be magnetic in nature. In this case, this study suggests that it's actually caused by a close passage of another star, and if so, it means that something passed through the early solar system, resulting in the increase in brightness and heat around the solar system, and then produced all these chondros we're observing today. But naturally, it's just one of the explanations we have so far. There are still some other ones that also make sense. This one though is very very interesting and very intriguing. It also means that maybe our solar system was disturbed in the beginning, and maybe this is the reason why our planets seem to look a little bit different from some of the other planets in other star systems. This disturbance would actually be quite dramatic and would produce very very different components on the inside. And this also implies that maybe this right here could be very similar to the solar system once all of the planets solidify and once the star system becomes a little bit more developed. At the moment, because it's only a few million years old, it's still a baby and not actually even a main sequence star yet. And so this is definitely a very intriguing discovery that might have implications on our understanding of how the early solar system was formed and how all of the early planets developed as well. But it will definitely need follow-up studies before all of this can be confirmed and before the scientists can actually accept this as a fact. And at least for now, a lot of scientists still think that many stars do form through these Fu Ori events, where suddenly there is a very very major increase in mass absorption due to a magnetic event. Something that's still not really understood, but something that seems to happen quite a lot. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this relatively new study that might have actually solved some of the biggest mysteries from the solar system. With one mystery being, why is it that our solar system doesn't seem to have any super Earths in it? The planets that seem to be all over the galaxy, but our solar system doesn't have any. With the other mystery being in regards to the types of planets we have in the solar system, the planets that are generally very rare in other star systems. And so this particular study that as always you can find in the description below, created some really interesting simulations potentially answering a lot of the questions about the current solar system and how it actually turned out to be the way it is. But before we talk about the study itself, let's I guess discuss some of the previous discoveries in regards to exoplanets. You're probably aware that we've already discovered several thousand exoplanets with many of them already confirmed, but if you were to take a look at the majority of them, generally speaking certain types of planets seem to be a little bit more common. Now obviously larger planets or more massive planets are easier to see so you would expect we'd find more of them. But if you were to actually look at the distribution of planets we've found so far, you'll discover a kind of a curve. And this curve is really interesting because 
It suggests that there are quite a lot of so-called sub-Neptunian planets and quite a lot of so-called super-Earths. With planets that are common in the solar system, so planets like Jupiter, planets like Saturn, and of course planets like Earth, Mars, and so on, being relatively rare. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of all of the planets we've discovered, and here we're talking about over 1500 of them, are super-Earths. Planets that are generally terrestrial, but they are also more massive than Earth itself, and are probably much bigger as well. And only a very small fraction, just under 200 of all confirmed terrestrial planets, have been similar to planet Earth. And that is of course a bit of a mystery. Is there something different about the solar system compared to other star systems? Or is there some sort of a mechanism that's responsible for creating certain types of planets in certain types of star systems? But the bigger question here is, was there ever a super Earth in the solar system? And if so, what happened to it? So there have been actually other studies suggesting that maybe there was a super Earth and it was either kicked out, becoming some sort of a lost world, so-called rogue planet, or potentially becoming the mysterious Planet Nine, or maybe it was swallowed by the Sun itself. But a lot of these previous assumptions or a lot of these previous theories were normally based on simulations that sort of use some of the older theories in terms of the planetary formation. This was actually done possibly several decades ago, and since then our understanding of how stars form and how planets form has improved quite a lot and helped us understand that in general planets do actually form using a lot of other mechanisms as well. Generally though, when it comes to planetary formation or the star system formation, the ideas are still kind of the same. We know that all of this starts with the typical nebular cloud, which eventually coalesces into some kind of a protoplanetary disk. This disk then starts to slowly coalesce into bigger and bigger rings, creating something that resembles this. Something that the scientists have observed in most of the protoplanetary disks around the galaxy. And so they all seem to form these unusual rings that you see right here. But these rings are generally quite different. Some of them, as you can see, look like this. Some of them are a lot thicker. And some of them are in different positions altogether. And according to this recent paper, it looks like these particular rings that are formed in the protoplanetary disks might play a huge role in forming certain types of planets or allowing certain planets to form and not allowing other planets to form. Furthermore, they even developed a model and a theory that seems to predict what sort of rings will form in certain types of star systems and what sort of planets these types of rings will then produce. Their model then recreated the actual solar system we live in almost to the T. And that's actually really unusual because a lot of previous models were never really that successful. As a matter of fact, in a lot of previous models, when they try to recreate the solar system, we either get planets that don't actually exist in the solar system, or more often we get more planets, with the biggest problem always being Mars. In the past, all of the previous models had Mars way, way more massive than it actually is. But this paper was able to recreate a model that seems to create a Mars that's about 10% the mass of planet Earth. Something that's never really been done before, and something that possibly suggests this model is correct after all. And so what exactly do the scientists propose here, and how do they explain the absence of super-Earths in the solar system? Well, in this case, their ideas start with the coalescence of the rings around the typical protoplanetary disk. In essence here, as everything starts to slowly move around and orbit around the central point, and as a lot of material starts to undergo gravitational collapse, as mentioned before, pretty much all of these protoplanetary disks eventually produce these ring formations that you see right here with very large gaps between them. And these gaps, first of all, are very different depending on the star itself, but also seem to influence the future orbits of future planets. And the formation of these particular rings in certain locations, according to the scientists, and according to some of the previous models, is most likely caused by what the scientists refer to as pressure bumps, which to some extent refers to the slightly higher pressure and density in a certain part of the disk, where a lot more coalescence happens, eventually accumulating more and more matter as the time goes on. And so the initially formed pressure bombs that were only small in the beginning eventually start accumulating more and more material and then start forming what we see as rings later on. Implying of course that many of these rings that you see right here very likely formed as a result of the initial slightly higher pressure in certain regions of the disk. 
And so these pressure bumps end up collecting more and more dust, accumulating into these large rings and producing areas around the protoplanetary disk that then allow even further accumulation, producing larger objects such as planetesimals, which then grow into planets. But interestingly enough, when they simulated some of these pressure bumps in the potential solar system, in approximately the first 100,000 years of the existence of the solar system, our solar system seemed to have three different rings. There was a ring in the location right here, kind of close to where Mars is today. They refer to this location as the silicate sublimation line because that's the location where silicates become solid and can then accumulate into larger objects. The second ring was somewhere between modern Jupiter and Saturn and is referred to as the water sublimation line or snow line. And then the last and the third ring was way farther away, slightly farther away than Pluto and is referred to as the carbon monoxide snow line. Then their model predicts that within the first few hundreds of thousands of years, or up to about one million year of the existence of the solar system, this will start producing a lot of different planetesimals of a certain type of material that will start moving around and will start producing slightly thicker rings, but also with a lot of material that will then start forming planets. And then within the next few millions of years, that's when we start getting certain types of planets. And so, in a nutshell, the three pressure bumps that eventually formed the rings end up producing all of the planets we're observing today, explaining exactly why they're so different, but also explaining why they're different from other exoplanets we've discovered so far. But I guess more interestingly, after running hundreds of simulations on the supercomputer, the results seem to be more or less the same. We would always get these four planets with relatively stable orbits, resembling the terrestrial planets we actually have in the solar system. The model also created the gas giants that we seem to have as well, but then also explained the existence of the Kuiper Belt objects and a lot of these dwarf planets we discovered in the last few years. And the fact that the model correctly predicts the formation of Mars that's about 10% of the mass of Earth, simply because it was created in the thinner part of the first ring where there was just not enough mass to create anything larger, makes this model extremely interesting because other models never really produced the correct Mars. But to answer the question of why there is no actual super Earth, well, it seems that in a lot of other star systems that do have these rings, if the middle ring is produced a little bit later, or in other words, if the inner ring is produced first and gets more time to accumulate mass and to produce planets, we tend to get super Earths because they basically get more time to create larger objects. In the solar system, it seems that the first ring, the closest ring, didn't really get that chance. The middle ring was created relatively quick and started producing planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Implying, of course, that the timing of the production of each of these rings might directly influence the type of planets that will be formed in a typical star system. So, for example, if the outer ring is formed first and if it gets more time to produce objects, we'll probably find a lot more icy objects in this particular star system, or at least more massive icy objects. Whereas if there is a ring that's closer to the star, we'll find more rocky or even supermassive rocky objects. Possibly even some of the most massive super Earths we've seen so far. And more importantly, that middle ring in the solar system might have also created a kind of a barrier or a kind of a wall, making sure that the materials between the outside and the inside do not mix. And only some of the star systems we've seen so far have these middle rings. That of course explains why certain star systems tend to have certain types of planets. And this simulation also was able to reproduce the asteroid belt, which seemed to contain materials from both the inner ring and the outer rings kind of simulating the actual asteroid belt that we find in the solar system. Once again, making this model extremely intriguing and potentially extremely accurate. And so in the end, the answer to the question of why we have these types of planets really comes down to that initial formation in the solar system with these tiny, tiny pressure bombs that might have formed completely by accident because certain material created certain types of bombs, which eventually led to certain types of rings which then created the barrier for certain planets to form that also prevented other planets from forming as well. So definitely a very intriguing theory and a very intriguing proposition, and hopefully follow-up papers will clarify this even further. When we think of space, we generally think of space as being pretty empty. Even the word itself implies emptiness.
But in reality, the interplanetary space, or even interstellar and intergalactic space, is filled with all sorts of materials. And although most of it does not really affect us, some of it, especially interplanetary dust, can actually create a lot of problems, especially when it comes to future manned missions. And because of this, a lot of scientists today have been trying to understand how exactly interplanetary dust works, what creates it, and if we can actually predict some of the patterns when it comes to, for example, predicting the location of the most dense regions of interplanetary dust, and thus avoiding it in some of the future missions. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the recent discoveries coming from the Parkers probe in regards to interplanetary dust. And specifically two different studies that identified major sources, or I guess major points of origin, for a lot of interplanetary dust that can hypothetically endanger future missions. Now first of all, obviously when it comes to dust itself, we don't generally think of it as something dangerous. We think asteroids and meteoroids are dangerous and possibly can cause damage to a spacecraft, but statistically speaking, these objects are actually more or less irrelevant to some of the future missions. Yet this, or the phenomenon known as the shooting stars, is actually quite relevant. This right here is a lot more dangerous and can hypothetically produce a lot of damage for any kind of a mission between, for example, Earth and planet Mars, or even Earth and the Moon. Now one good example that comes to mind is from the Space Shuttle mission back in 1983, specifically the STS-7 mission, that officially reported the first ever space debris collision that could potentially be somewhat dangerous. This is actually the window from the Space Shuttle that was most likely hit by some sort of a tiny tiny piece of paint that was moving at a ridiculously fast speed. And so obviously on a much longer mission, specifically a mission moving between planets that might last several months, a lot of such collisions could be possible, and so trying to avoid them and trying to predict them in advance would be extremely beneficial for future missions. And the thing is, we've already discussed one of these phenomena known as the Zodiacal Light in one of the previous videos, where one of the missions, and here we're talking about the mission to Jupiter known as the Juno mission, has experienced a dramatic increase in collisions when it was transferring from planet Earth to planet Jupiter. And here it passed through the zodiacal lights that we believe were produced by planet Mars. Or in other words, the dust from Mars itself was sort of circulating around the solar system and is very likely responsible for this phenomenon we refer to as the zodiacal light that we generally see in the night skies right before the sunrise or right after sunset. But obviously Mars is not the only source of this. As a matter of fact, in the past it was believed that asteroids and comets most likely produce most of the interplanetary dust. Mars as an origin of these particles was a surprise discovery. But this was an important discovery because during the transit, several major collisions occurred with the solar panels on Juno, which in theory could actually be really damaging for any manned mission. And so this beautiful phenomenon responsible for the shooting stars on Earth theoretically can be very damaging for any manned mission that lasts for longer than a few months. And just in case you were wondering, these tiny particles are actually really really small. They're called interplanetary dust for a reason. Most of these particles are microscopic, with some of them being only 10 thousandth of a millimeter, which makes them practically invisible. But when they collide with something, because generally they have speeds of anywhere from a few tens of kilometers per second up to about 80 kilometers per second, they can easily puncture a spacesuit or a relatively thin window, and in some cases they can create a lot of other damage as well. So for example, if they crash into a spacecraft, they tend to completely vaporize and also create a lot of electrically charged particles which is, by the way, how the Parker probe is also able to detect them as well, by measuring the overall electromagnetic field around itself and detecting the sudden jumps in electromagnetic emissions when these particles create the charge from the evaporation. This presents a perfect opportunity to study and to analyze the actual collision effects from each of these particles. And so for the Parker Solar Probe, that's going to become the closest object to the Sun by 2024, it already got to pass through a lot of different regions in the solar system, and during its journey it also got to experience collisions from a lot of interplanetary particles, a lot of dust particles, with various sources of origin. 
And because the cloud itself is almost impossible to see except for maybe certain locations and certain specific conditions when the light from the sun strikes the cloud in just the right way, creating some sort of a useful interplanetary dust map and also figuring out the exact patterns of where the dust is the thickest is really really important for these future missions. But generally the scientists today really believe that it's probably the thickest right near the sun. As a matter of fact, it most likely resembles a typical protoplanetary disk. Here it's going to be the thickest closest to the sun, it's going to have certain dips here and there, and it probably also has certain regions around planets where it's also thick as well. But even though generally we can see this in other star systems, mostly because we're looking at them from the outside, in our own solar system we have to rely on probes like the Parker Solar Probe to try to map the distribution of the interplanetary dust. And so the recent two studies discovered at least two more different sources of the interplanetary dust that we have to be aware of for some of the future missions. Now one of the reasons why Parker Solar Probe is probably the best probe to study all of this is because close to the sun we sort of expect the highest and the thickest levels of dust and because of this it collides with itself the most. When the collisions like this happen, this ends up creating even tinier fast moving particles that are usually referred to as beta meteoroids. And because these particles are so so tiny, the solar pressure, the solar radiation, ends up pushing them away from the sun and so they actually slowly escape the solar system, or at least stay on the outskirts. But interestingly enough, these particles are produced by what's known as the alpha meteoroids. And these particles have an almost completely opposite type of motion. These are actually the dust particles that are slightly larger and are slowly moving closer and closer to the sun. And when these alpha meteoroids collide with each other, that's when they end up producing beta meteoroids. Although that process of spiraling toward the sun can actually take several million years. But the collisions once they happen end up releasing beta meteoroids that move even faster, but in this case they're also kind of more or less random in terms of direction. And so because of this randomness, at the moment they're sort of unpredictable and to some extent kind of dangerous. But much more surprisingly, and I guess much more interestingly, was the discovery of some beta particles, some beta meteoroids, that had an extremely precise direction and were always happening in the same spot. The actual emissions looked something like this, and as you can kind of see from the simulation that you can find in the description below, this was most likely caused by some sort of an asteroid or a comet that very likely left a lot of particles in a kind of a torus shape, and interestingly as the particles from the comet or the asteroid or from the steroid shape collide with the particles that represent these so-called alpha meteoroids, or basically these leftovers from the protoplanetary disk, they ended up producing very directional beta meteoroids that were always sort of pointing in the same direction. Something that the scientists behind this paper referred to as the beta stream. And this right here represents probably the most dangerous of these particular particles. Mostly because of the total density of these particles and because they're always sort of moving really fast in a single direction. By the way, this is exactly how the shooting star phenomenon is produced as well. Our planet Earth once in a while moves through these so-called toroids produced by ancient comets. Inside of these toroids are a lot of different dust particles that when they collide with the atmosphere of planet Earth end up producing the shooting stars. With the only difference here being that these particles are not really moving as fast and not in the same direction. Whereas in the beta stream they would be moving in the same direction and also extremely fast. And so if a spacecraft were to fly through this, it would be almost like flying through this stream of extremely fast moving tiny particles with each of them having enough power to create a tiny hole. And though the spacecraft itself might be okay depending on the protection, if one of the astronauts has to go outside in order to possibly fix something, that's when it becomes a problem. Each of these particles has enough power to easily pierce an astronaut's suit. But the good thing is that these beta streams despite their danger, would also be the easiest to predict and the easiest to anticipate, assuming we can actually find all of these toruses, all of these leftovers from various comets and asteroids, and can somehow map their movement around the solar system, which would potentially create a kind of a map of things and areas we should kind of avoid, and also areas that are more or less safe. And so because of the Parker's solar probe interaction with all of these meteoroids and all of these tiny particles, or basically because it experienced its own meteor shower, it allowed us to create at least one of these tiny maps of the region really really close to the sun itself. 
while also discovering some really important features of most of these interplanetary dust particles and how they sort of interact with one another and also what dangers they pose to future missions. With this one right here being probably the most dangerous of them all. This is something that a lot of scientists will probably have to study in more detail in order to determine if any of these unusual beta streams exist on, for example, the way from Earth to Mars or from Mars to other planets. Because that's definitely something that you would want to avoid if you're flying from one planet to another. And if one day we end up becoming an interstellar species, well, this is a phenomenon that we can expect from every other star system out there as well. But before that, if one day we want to try to colonize Mars, we definitely have to be aware of all of this and be prepared for any potential damage caused by these tiny invisible particles, many of which are produced by Mars itself. And so just to summarize the three major discoveries here, we first of all have these alpha meteoroids, which are probably either the leftovers from the early solar system or possibly some of the dust from the asteroid belt and from some of the other region that's kind of slowly making its way toward the center of the solar system and is coming closer and closer to the sun. We then have these extremely fast moving beta meteoroids, which are much smaller in size but are also moving way faster and these are produced by the original particles colliding with one another. And we lastly have the beta streams, which are also particles that collide with alpha meteoroids but are generally produced from leftover comets or asteroids. And generally, all three of them very likely pose danger to some of the future missions. So trying to map their density around the solar system and also identify certain regions we should avoid is probably going to become a priority if we do become an interplanetary species one day. But until we start exploring the solar system and until we start mapping all of these dust particles, that's I guess all we know for now. I'm sure a lot more information is going to come from the Parker Solar Probe in the next 5 years or so, but even these few years of its operation have already revealed so much about the solar system. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and, well, let's just jump right into it. This tiny green dot you see right here, that's essentially the first ever potential candidate for the existence of Planet 9, the hypothetical ninth planet located somewhere in the solar system. But because there is so much more to this story and because this is not actually even that certain just yet, I wanted to discuss this in more detail, starting with the study itself and the single scientist who was able to discover all of this, Michael Rowan Robinson, whose study as always you can find in the description below. And so let's talk a little bit more about what exactly he did compared to some of the other scientists and why he was able to find this one candidate while no one else could. And also discuss the possibility of this actually being that planet we're looking for or if it's just another object that's going to be identified as something entirely different. And let's begin with the Planet 9 itself. So by now you're probably familiar with the story already, but just to give you a brief overview, a few years ago several scientists started to discover the distant objects that we often refer to as TNOs, also known as trans-Neptunian objects. Around this time this is when Pluto was officially demoted from being a planet to being what's known as a dwarf planet. And so quite a lot of these objects started to be discovered and a few of them seemed to possess very unusual orbits with very specific inclinations that would be difficult to explain unless something was pulling at them from a somewhat distant region in the solar system. Mostly because they were far enough not to be affected by anything including Neptune and so these unusual orbits were kind of difficult to explain at first. And because of the relative similarity of their tilt, several scientists independently proposed that maybe there's actually some sort of a hidden object such as the ninth planet. And maybe this particular planet is pulling at these objects just enough to create these visible changes in their orbit. But this was based on the observation of just a few of these objects. Since then, in the last uh, 6 or 7 years, a lot more of these TNOs have been discovered and some of the orbits did not actually match anything. As a matter of fact, several other explanations have been proposed including the potential gravitational effects from pretty much the entire region that we refer to as the Oort Cloud and the potential scientific bias when it comes to observing these specific TNOs. As a matter of fact, one of the best explanations was described in one of the videos before and that was basically that maybe we're just biased at when we're looking for these objects and where exactly we're finding them. In other words, the existence of Planet 9 started to be kind of questioned. And so many scientists were still quite divided about its existence. 
On the one hand, we expect there to be some sort of a, another planet based on the simulations of the formation of the solar system, but on the other hand, um, well, some of the previous surveys, specifically infrared surveys, did not really discover anything, or at least anything big and warm enough. A smaller object could still exist somewhere, but we're just probably not seeing it. And there was even an eccentric proposition that maybe all of these observations are caused by some sort of a primordial black hole that's just invisible to us. Now that was an explanation that was sort of far-fetched, but it was scientifically valid in the sense that we know that primordial black holes can definitely exist, and assuming that something is gravitationally pulling at these objects, well, maybe it's a black hole. And so there were definitely a lot of different propositions to try to explain all of these unusual observations in the orbital parameters. And so assuming that such a planet does exist, well, where would it be located and what sort of a planet would it be? Well, the initial proposition was that it was anywhere between 5 and 10 masses of planet Earth, and it was probably about 400 to 800 astronomical units away from the Sun. So basically it would be a Neptune-like world, very very cold Neptune-like world, and it would be really really far, way past the orbit of Pluto. But because nothing was really being detected with these particular parameters, the scientists had to rework some of their initial assumptions. The most recent assumption is that, well, it's probably about half as far, maybe between about 380 and 460 AU. And the mass of the planet could also be a little bit smaller, possibly five masses of planet Earth, or even less. But the two major infrared surveys that are usually really really good at detecting these objects, or even detecting small comets, and so here we're talking about the WISE survey and the PAN stars, did not discover anything in any of their data. Or to be more exact, they ruled out anything that size of Neptune or in that vicinity. So nothing that would be about 8 to 10 masses of planet Earth seems to exist anywhere in the solar system except for, of course, inner solar system. Although the thing is, these surveys did not cover the entire night skies. Some of the other patches had to be covered by some other telescopes. One such telescope is the 8 meter Subaru telescope located in Hawaii. But once again, as of to date, nothing was discovered by any of these telescopes. And without an actual visual observation of Planet 9, its existence is, well, it's very hypothetical, and it's basically just an assumption, a big assumption. As a matter of fact, making the announcement so quickly about this planet unfortunately gave science a little bit of a bad credibility, at least in my opinion. Nevertheless, it did kickstart a tremendous search of the night skies which allowed the scientists in the last few years to discover a lot of super super cool things we've discussed on the channel already. Now there is actually one telescope that everyone's looking forward to, the Vera Rubin telescope, that's definitively going to be able to search the entire night skies and identify every single hidden object in there. But that telescope is still a few years away from being operational and from being able to conduct such a search. Okay, but then how exactly did this person discover something? Well, he did something entirely different, something really, really smart. He looked at an extremely old data from one of the first surveys, infrared surveys, of the entire night skies. Or basically the granddaddy of all infrared surveys, IRAS, Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And this was a survey conducted nearly 40 years ago, 1983. It lasted for just under one year, but collected quite a lot of data. And what's really really cool about this telescope is that, well, it seemed to have been extremely good at detecting a lot of infrared things that at first made no sense to anyone. For example, during its operation, it detected several sources of infrared radiation coming from several stars. But when the scientists used Hubble telescope or a lot of more powerful telescopes to look at those stars, they found nothing. So initially, this was assumed to be some sort of a mistake and possibly just something wrong with the telescope. Turns out it was seeing something. It was actually detecting infrared signatures from various protoplanetary disks, and this was not discovered until 2014 using some of the most powerful telescopes out there. So it was basically detecting this, and it was doing so 30 years before it was officially discovered by, for example, Spitzer Telescope and modern version of the Hubble Telescope. It then also discovered some other mysterious infrared signatures, which in the beginning did not make any sense. Later on, the scientists realized that what they were looking at is this, the so-called infrared cirrus, or these galactic filaments that basically form these very very large infrared clouds and that seem to be present in many regions of the galaxy. And some other infrared points turned out to be very distant galaxies, something that was also not seen by any previous telescopes until then. 
Although interestingly, back in the days, back in 1983, one of the biggest headlines was actually in regards to a potential detection of some kind of an object in the solar system. Maybe a planet, maybe something else. But this is really important because it turned out to be not in a solar system at all. Because it's kind of difficult to measure distances in space, this turned out to be extremely far away and was actually once again one of these serious clouds. And so there was at least one case when it was basically a mistaken identity. But nevertheless, this telescope was able to discover over 250,000 different objects in the night skies and many of them have not really been classified even today. And so for this particular study, Michael Rowan Robinson decided to go with the survey, decided to use the data from here, and specifically focused on trying to figure out what would hypothetical Planet 9 look like if it were to appear in this survey. In other words, what sort of a point would it represent? Would it be a large point? Would it have certain other parameters? And well, by making this assumption, he decided to go through the entire survey and see if he can actually discover anything that matches these particular observations with the planet itself very likely just being a single dot somewhere in the survey itself. But a dot that would be unidentified and that would be probably traveling in a somewhat eccentric orbit. Now pretty much most of the objects in the survey are either asteroids, galaxies or different Cirrus clouds. So for the most part, all of the points he discovered suggested that it was something that was already known or something that was not a planet at all. But this was under the assumption that the planet would be slightly larger, anywhere from maybe 5 to 10 masses of planet Earth, and that it would be 400 to 800 AU away from the Sun. And with these particular parameters, nothing was discovered in these regions of the solar system. This is of course including the entire night skies. But what if we lower the mass of the potential planet 9 and move it a little bit closer to the sun? So here, something that's maybe less than 5 masses of planet Earth at a total distance of anywhere from 200 to 400 AU. Now first of all, at this point, the object would be slightly larger. It would be maybe 2 or even 3 points. And because this object would be moving across the night skies, it would also have a specific separation between the first detection and the last detection. And using these parameters, several hundred different points have been identified in this survey, but the majority once again were not really planets, but once again were either galaxies, different clouds, or a lot of different comets and asteroids. Except for this one point right here. There was one single candidate that seemed to fit right into the description of what the scientist was looking for. And here the distance would be about 225 AU and the total mass of this object would be anywhere from 3 to 5 masses of planet Earth. But remember, super preliminary discovery. There is a really really high chance that this is actually something entirely different. And this is exactly what the scientist concludes his paper with. But I guess the question is, why was it not seen before? And how exactly can we prove this uh, object and its existence? Well, the main reason it was not seen in previous surveys is because of its relatively high location in the night skies. As in, it has a relatively high ecliptic latitude, while at the same time having a low galactic latitude. And many of the previous surveys just didn't really look in this region. The author also admits that because the telescope is relatively old and this is basically one of the first technologies using this, the data here is not of the highest quality, so additional observations are needed to see if this is really there. He also provides the overall orbital calculations, suggesting where we can possibly detect it today. While at the same time, additional observations using other frequencies is also needed to see what's happening here. For example, using radio telescopes, using optical telescopes, and using a lot of other observations to determine exactly what this object is and what exactly was discovered in the survey. So for example, if it's discovered that this is a stationary object and it hasn't moved at all in the last, what is it, like 38 years? Well, this would mean that it's not an object in the solar system at all. It's probably once again some sort of a distant infrared object that created an unusually similar appearance to a planet in the solar system. However, if this object moved across the night skies as predicted here, and if it's also detected by some of the other surveys, for example optical telescopes or radio telescopes, well then we're onto something for sure. Which means that, well, we now need to wait for follow-ups, for additional observations, and the potentially groundbreaking news about maybe discovering a new planet in the solar system. But until this is either confirmed or denied, once again, an extremely preliminary discovery. An exciting discovery, but still very very preliminary. Something that we're going to explore in some of the future videos once this is either confirmed or explained in some other way. Either way though, it's going to be a really exciting explanation. 
Once in a while, we discover something absolutely incredible in our own solar system. And today is that day. Hello, wonderful person. Today we're going to be talking about a discovery of a very unusual and somewhat mysterious object that the scientists believe to be possibly a dwarf planet coming all the way from the Oort cloud with an average orbit of about 4 million years. And it was just detected on the approach to the inner solar system. And in approximately 10 years from now, its closest approach is going to take it all the way to the orbit of Saturn. But because of the sheer size of this object, it makes it the largest comet in the inner solar system in the last few hundreds of years. Although it's not really clear if it's going to be easily visible like some of the other comets we've recently seen. What is however clear is that this is an object coming from really really far away in the outer regions of the solar system and might create an excellent opportunity for us to study some of these objects from the Oort cloud. The cloud that goes way way beyond the Kuiper's belt and beyond the orbit of Pluto and essentially represents the outer edges of the solar system, something that's ridiculously far away, to some extent representing the gravitational limit where our sun can still sort of hold on to some of these objects, and anything past that is technically interstellar space. But first of all, how exactly was this found? Well, it turns out that the images of this object were originally taken back in 2014, but they weren't really seen and analyzed until relatively recently. All of this was part of the Dark Energy Survey, also known as DES, that's already been able to produce a lot of really interesting discoveries. But I guess this new discovery was really unexpected. Now, originally all of this was reported right here in the Minor Planet Center, and it was actually a report of an unusual object detected in the dark energy survey data. A report that I later read on this minor planet mailing list, where a citizen astronomer by the name of Sam Dean was quick enough to explain exactly what the scientists discovered. And by analyzing the trajectory of this object, the scientists have already worked out exactly where it's going to pass in the solar system and how long it's going to take to reach the farthest part of its orbit, with the closest approach that's going to be just past the orbit of Saturn taking place sometime in 2031. And by the way, it took this object about 3 million years to reach this point, which of course means that it spent most of its time far far away from the center of the solar system and also very likely has never really been exposed to much sunlight, which also is already quite evident because it became a comet even far away from the sun itself. It's currently at a distance of about 22 astronomical units um, away from the sun, which is already closer than Neptune. But even here, it's already started to exhibit a little bit of a cometary tail, which is of course one of the reasons why it was uh, discovered by the scientists. And in the last seven years, since the first images uh, taken in 2014, it already managed to travel seven astronomical units. And since it already developed this cometary tail at these distances, it implies that it contains a lot of extreme volatiles. Kind of similar to this other comet that came from a really far away distance, and was analyzed approximately two years ago back in 2019. This one here contained a lot of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which emitted a really large tail really far away from the solar system. And this of course implies that this is, once again, what's known as very pristine material. Material that has been untouched by pretty much anything for possibly billions of years and very likely represents some of the most natural and most scientifically curious types of ices that have ever been seen so close to the sun. Although unfortunately, currently the scientists believe that even when it comes really close to the sun, it's not going to create an extremely bright tail unlike some of the other comets. It's going to be visible using uh, scientific instruments, but not really as easily visible using some of the telescopes you might have lying around at home. Although we don't really know, and chances are it might still change its luminosity in approximately 10 years. But what makes this object particularly interesting now is not really the fact that it's a comet or that it's going to pass really close to Saturn. What makes it interesting is its orbit and of course the fact that it's so big. It's possibly about 300 kilometers in diameter, and that makes it almost a dwarf planet, possibly even a dwarf planet, depending on what it contains on the inside. As a matter of fact, it has a very high chance of being somewhat spherical, which of course would make it a dwarf planet by definition. But in this case, it's a very unique dwarf planet. It's coming from really far away reaches of space. It also seems to be really dark. It's only about 1 to possibly 8% reflective, which is somewhat dark for these objects. With the surface maybe resembling something similar to what we see on Pluto, the darker patches here, that do contain a lot of tollings and a lot of other compounds that sort of make it really dark. 
But the other intriguing part about this object is of course how eccentric the orbit is. It's like 99.99% eccentric. Meaning that there was always a chance some star could have stolen this object from the solar system or there is maybe a chance that our sun stole this object from some other star system that passed close to us. So in other words, there is a lot of opportunity for us to do some really good science here, assuming that a mission to this object happens in the next few years. And the thing is, after 2031, it's going to once again go all the way to the farthest reaches of the solar system, and specifically at a distance of about 50,000 astronomical units away from the sun. And it might technically never really come back from there. We know that in the next few million years, another star is going to come really close to the sun, and it might dislodge this object from its current orbit, thus sending it to interstellar space. But the outbound orbit is assumed to be roughly around 4.5 million years, meaning that if it ever comes back to the inner solar system, it's going to be in the next 4.5 million years from now. And so we definitely cannot miss this opportunity, and I think uh, NASA or some other agencies need to start planning a mission here soon. Currently, it's not even known what sort of an object this is. Technically, it's a comet, it could be a dwarf planet, but it could be a completely new type of an object as well. As a matter of fact, some of the scientists have compared this to one of the previous comets from about 300 years ago, from 1729. The comet of 1729 was allegedly the largest object, the largest cometary object that ever approached the solar system. It might have been one of the brightest, if not the brightest comets ever seen. Apparently it had like six tails and was also in an extremely eccentric orbit and possibly has completely left the solar system by now as well. And because of this, comets like this are extremely interesting both for science and also for general public. These events are extremely rare. Although in terms of the size of objects in the inner solar system, it's obviously not the largest object that experiences the cometary activity. There are a few other objects like the centaurs of Jupiter and this one specifically known as Chiron that do this once in a while as well. Chiron is about 212 kilometers in diameter and once in a while it starts being a comet as well. If I zoom out of here, you'll see that it does have a cometary tail right now as well. But Chiron has been in the inner solar system for an extremely long time. And though NASA obviously hopes to study it one day, it's maybe not as interesting as C2014 UN271, the object that doesn't really have a cool name just yet. But there's actually another important reason to try to possibly launch a mission here and to try to study this in more detail. This is in regards to a recent study that analyzed and tried to recreate the Oort cloud by using a variety of different simulations. And what the scientists discovered here is that, for the most part, the objects in the Oort cloud seem to have at least three different origins. The first obvious origin is what you see right here. They got kicked out as they interacted with various planets such as Jupiter and Saturn in the beginning of the solar system. Others were probably just the leftovers of the original protoplanetary disk from which the solar system was made approximately 4.5 billion years ago. But the third origin of these objects is what makes them so exciting. A lot of them very likely came from other star systems, which means that they were captured by our sun as it passed close to some of the other stars in the past. And this is probably especially true of the objects that are really far away from the sun in the beginning, including possibly this object as well. There is a slight chance that it possibly came from another star system and is either much older or much younger and thus could contain completely different components on the inside and present a super interesting opportunity for us to study these objects. Now obviously the chance that this is an interstellar object is pretty slim, but it's still there. And the fact that it's a large object and it's already emitting a lot of materials means that this is a pristine object that has not really experienced a lot of starlight before. Although unfortunately, because of the distances involved, and also because this would be a pretty expensive mission, chances of it actually happening right now are pretty slim. Unless the scientists start planning this mission and are somehow able to launch it in the next couple of years, it's going to be extremely difficult to catch up with this comet, or this possible dwarf planet, or this interstellar visitor, whatever you want to call it. We're not going to know what it is for a few months at least. Either way, this is definitely one of the most exciting discoveries of the recent times and it's probably going to create a lot of excitement and a lot of new studies in the next few months as well. Although personally, I'm really hoping for an actual mission because this would be a once in a lifetime opportunity. 
a wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the new discoveries coming from the Voyager 1 probe that's essentially the farthest object humanity has ever built somewhere out there in the interstellar space. But today I wanted to discuss the mission as well and also just talk about what the scientists found, what it means to our understanding of the galaxy and the universe, and more importantly, remind you of some of the coolest achievements of this mission. Now, as you probably already know, Voyager mission is basically two different probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, with both probes taking a slightly different approach or slightly different path out of the solar system. Voyager 1 took this path, flying by Jupiter and Saturn, whereas Voyager 2 also got to visit Uranus and Neptune, with both probes obviously being exactly the same as well. But the mission itself would not be possible without these wonderful people from JPL who essentially proposed this and further pushed for this mission to be developed in the early 70s. But originally there was actually only one person that sort of made all of this start. It was this wonderful person, Gary Flandro, and he back in 1966, completely by accident, realized that in the late 70s, all four planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, are going to align with one another in such a way that you could actually send a spacecraft visiting all four planets using previous planet to provide what's known as the slingshot maneuver. So here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune align in just a perfect way to create an opportunity for what's known as the Grand Tour, visiting all planets, or in this case four major planets, with a single mission. And that's basically how the Voyager mission was born. One of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious, NASA missions ever. Something that cost them close to about $1 billion. And this is actually something that happens once every 175 years. So the next time this is going to be possible, I don't think most of us are going to be around anymore. But the thing is, the original mission design was really only set up to have these probes function for 5 years. From 1977 to roughly around 1982. At least the Voyager 1 probe. Voyager 2, because it also got to visit Neptune, was supposed to function until 1989. And so nobody could predict or expect the probes to function for so long. They've been actually communicating with planet Earth for the past 43 years, as of today, as of 2021. And moreover, they're still actually doing a pretty good job at also sending us a lot of data. NASA created this website specifically for the Voyager missions, allowing us to see the mission status and also showing us some of the parameters that they also get to detect here from planet Earth. It also shows you which instruments are still functioning and which ones have been disabled because there's just not enough power. And more importantly, it also allows you to see exactly where the probes are located in comparison to everything else in the solar system. Earth, by the way, is somewhere right there, very, very close to the center of the solar system. But until 2012, pretty much all of the observations we've been making with all of the other probes as well have always been inside what's known as the heliosphere. Or inside this really, really large plasma bubble that's formed by our sun as it starts emitting various solar winds and a lot of different particles, showering the nearby space in these particles. But in 2012, Voyager 1 probe left this particular region and entered the actual interstellar space. The scientists got to detect the helio sheath here, and there was quite a lot of exciting reports about this back then as well, and now it's traveling in between stars, it's traveling in the interstellar space. And a few years ago, when Voyager 2 also reached this particular location, we also got to understand that this whole helio sheath is almost like a plasma wall. It's basically a relatively thick region that both probes had to pass through. But what's really cool about both of the probes is that they've been continuously sending all of the data back to scientists, allowing them to study specific electron densities or plasma densities of various regions in the interstellar space allowing the scientists to start mapping what happens in between stars as well. And there have already been a few pretty interesting discoveries. One of the most recent and most unusual discoveries is in regards to what NASA referred to as the plasma hum. Essentially almost like a humming noise of the background plasma that seems to be present across the interstellar space. And very recently, the NASA scientists were able to convert all of these observations into the actual sounds we can hear as well. Now, you're going to hear them in a few seconds, but essentially, this is what we're looking at. Now, this is from between 2012 and now, and notice how there are at least two different spots here that represent some sort of a really, really major plasma wave. But let's just actually hear this first.
And so these seem to represent some sort of um, interstellar plasma waves of what seems to be really large chunks of plasma, or basically gas that's uh, ionized. And according to the scientists, similar observations have been done pretty much every single year. So there are these really large chunks of gas that seem to be spread out across really large vast uh, distances of space in between stars. Now, right now we believe that there are possibly three ways that these can be generated. The smallest of these objects most likely just come from the interactions or from the effects from our sun. And so in this case, various solar eruptions and various shock waves produced by the sun very likely just disturbed the heliosphere and expanded just a little bit, producing these tiny chunks of gas. Now this one here is a little bit exaggerated, but this is just to give you a visual perspective. And so the smallest ones that were detected so far were very likely just produced by the sun and various eruptions. And even though I'm saying small, in terms of the actual size, these would be anywhere from a few million to possibly a few billion kilometers or miles in size. A lot of bigger ones that have not been observed yet would also be produced by various ancient supernova. Now we've seen these with various telescopes, we just haven't seen these with the Voyager craft yet. And a lot of them you can explore on this map that's available in the description below, with the nearest one, the one we're flying through right now, known as the Local Interstellar Cloud. You can sort of learn more about the ideas behind this and what possibly created this in one of the videos somewhere right there. But some of the biggest of these unusual gas clouds and these plasma clouds in the interstellar space are probably created by the galaxy itself, with some of these gas clouds visible as these darker patches all over the galaxy. This is formed by the motion of the galaxy as it rotates, and as various masses interact here, they essentially create various gas-like formations inside galaxies all over the place. But once again, this is not something that the Voyager probe just saw. It only saw the ones from the Sun. And in case you were wondering how it's able to do all of this after 43 years, well, the answer to this is, first of all, is this, the reactor, the RTG that's using nuclear energy to generate electricity, still has approximately 75% of material able to produce energy and provide enough wattage for at least three more years, possibly even four years. But the actual detection is done with these two long antennae you see sticking out on both sides. These are plasma wave antenna and they both are able to detect the minute vibrations of electrons near the spacecraft. And by detecting those vibrations, it can then transmit the detail and transmit all the data back to Earth. This is known as the Voyager's plasma wave system. And what's really unusual is that after the Voyager left the solar system, the actual density of electrons increased by about 40 times. And so it reached the current levels back in 2015. Which sort of implies that the plasma levels outside of the solar system are slightly higher than just inside of it on the outskirts. But this is of course something that NASA is hoping to learn with some of the new missions, including the currently planned mission that's going to be specifically for the interstellar space. If it ever occurs, it's going to go into the outskirts of the solar system much faster than any craft before, and it's going to reach the same regions of space in only a few years. But right now this is still being planned and it's not even certain if it's ever going to happen. But if this mission does happen, it's going to be a really exciting mission to follow because it's going to help us explore the interstellar space and answer a lot of the questions about the universe, the galaxy where we live, and of course our own existence as well. For now though, we still have approximately 3 to maybe 4 years before Voyager probes officially shut down and officially sort of become retired, but until then the scientists are going to try to get as much data from these probes as possible. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some really intriguing discoveries in regards to the origin of the core of Mercury. The discovery which potentially may help us understand why certain planets have certain types of cores and can also help us understand how we can potentially use this technique in identifying and analyzing various planets outside of the solar system, the so-called exoplanets. And although this discovery is to some extent somewhat unusual and somewhat unexpected, it's important to understand what the problem here was to begin with. And I guess the problem starts right here with the four terrestrial planets in the solar system. Now the smallest one here is Mercury, and the largest one here is Earth. But if we try to open up these planets and try to analyze their insides, specifically looking at things like the inner core, and compare the sizes of cores to the sizes of these planets, we would discover a slightly different pattern. Even though Mars is the second smallest object, 
it has the smallest iron core of all four planets, with Mercury being second, Venus being third and Earth having the largest iron core. But then if we look at the proportions of the iron core to the mass of the planet, suddenly here Mercury comes on top. Mercury has the largest iron core of all of them, with Earth being second, Venus being third, Mars being fourth. Now this is not the mystery, this is actually something that we've known for a very long time, but the original explanation, well, it was not really satisfactory. Originally the explanation suggests that Earth and Venus are just sister planets, so they have a relatively similar size core. Mars is a little bit farther on the outskirts, so it didn't really get enough metal, whereas Mercury was probably much much more massive and much larger in the beginning. But because of a lot of different collisions in the beginning of the solar system, it was very likely stripped of the outer layer, losing a tremendous amount of matter and a lot of different rocks and silicates in the process. And so the explanation here was that maybe the outer shell of Mercury just kind of disappeared because of the early collisions. And to date this is the most accepted explanation in regards to the formation of this really large core. The core here is so large as a matter of fact, that Mercury is the only other terrestrial planet that has an active magnetosphere, although not as powerful as planet Earth. Neither Venus nor Mars have magnetospheres. But this explanation was not accepted by all scientists and didn't really explain everything about Mercury's origins. And because of this, the scientist whose paper you can find in the description below, and whose main author is also known for developing an interesting Earth model that is often used to determine composition of different exoplanets, presents an entirely different model and a very satisfactory explanation for the differences between these terrestrial planets. The new model here relies on the idea behind the early planetary formation in the beginning of the solar system, when the solar system was just a protoplanetary disk. During these early times in the solar system, the sun was very different. This was a protoplanetary disk and it was very likely just a large amount of dust a large amount of different types of grains, of iron and a lot of other materials, and a lot and a lot of magnetic fields. Today we know that a lot of these protoplanetary disks are extremely magnetically active. The interaction between the star and the magnetic field is actually responsible for the majority of the star's initial growth. A lot of these early stars grow by absorbing a tremendous amount of material that falls along these magnetic lines that you see right here. And because of these early interactions and tremendously powerful magnetic fields, combined with the fact that magnetic fields usually become weaker as you move away from the object itself, results in the formation of a kind of a gradient along the length of the protoplanetary disk. The more magnetic field we find here, the more metallic materials we're going to discover as well. And as you move away from the disk, you're going to find less and less metallic materials. And depending on the location where the early planets were developed, they would have a different proportions of different materials present. The closer to the sun they were, the more likely they would have a lot more iron present on the inside. And based on the model, there should be a kind of a correlation between the distance where the planet developed and the amount of or the proportions of metal present inside the planet, which at the same time also should correlate with the average density of the planet as well. Well, it just so happens if we are, try to graph this and if we actually put this into some sort of a table, we'll get something that looks like this. The part on the left shows us the average density, whereas the axis on the bottom shows us the distance from the sun. And it looks like there's a very high correlation between the distance from the sun, the planetary density, and also the size of the iron core on the inside compared to the rest of the planet, which also correlates with the total strength of the magnetosphere of the early solar system. And this is a really important finding because it essentially allows us to understand that the magnetosphere or the magnetic effects from these early solar systems or early star systems is extremely important in helping us understand what the actual exoplanets or other planets are going to be made out of. Their composition depends on the magnetosphere. And because the scientists in this paper also calculate how the magnetic field would most likely draw a lot of these metallic materials, while also controlling the presence of other types of elements in the uh, planetary disk, it also helps us understand what other elements we might be able to discover in certain star systems or even in the planets in our own solar system. So in other words, we can actually use the calculations from various magnetic field studies to try to figure out where exactly we're going to find certain elements and possibly then apply this to some other planets somewhere out there. 
At the same time, this sort of gives us a way to look for planets with potential life on the surface. So for example, today we know that inside our own planet, a lot of the essential for life elements such as phosphorus are actually stuck inside the core. This was something that happened because of the distribution of different elements and of course the interaction with the magnetic field when the solar system was still very young. This also of course means that we might be able to use these techniques to find other planets out there that have very similar composition and very similar life-giving elements on the surface as well. Although naturally that's not something we're able to do just yet. At the same time, this now helps scientists to be a little bit more careful when analyzing exoplanets as well. For example, let's just say we found a star system such as this one, TRAPPIST-1, where we know what the star is made out of. We understand the composition of the star pretty well. But does that mean that we can kind of figure out what the planetary composition is just based on the star itself? Well, this particular study implies that the answer is no, we cannot really know the composition of a planet that way. As a matter of fact, it implies that we need to understand how the star transformed and more importantly, what sort of a magnetic field it had in the beginning for us to try to determine what the planet is going to be like. So if we actually discover that TRAPPIST-1 used to be an extremely highly magnetic star system, it does give a lot of these planets a really high chance of being very similar to planet Earth they might have very high iron content and possibly even have really strong magnetospheres. But unfortunately, just looking at the star and the elements present in the star is not really going to provide any of these answers. And the major problem here is that we do not really have a very good way of determining the magnetic field of a typical star by just looking at it with our telescopes from planet Earth. There are no current techniques known to us that can actually establish if these particular stars used to be extremely magnetic and possibly provided a lot of iron for various planets, or they were more or less quiet and did not get a chance to create a kind of a gradient we observe in the solar system. Which could be true of some of these smaller stars such as red dwarfs, or maybe some other stars because we're not entirely sure if the star formation for some of these stars is different from one another. But I guess the new question is, well, can we actually prove any of this? Is it an actual theory or is this just a coincidence that seems to work for the solar system? Well, to try to answer this, the scientists now would have to find another star system, hopefully very, very similar to the solar system, where they can actually see a lot of different rocky planets kind of similar to what we have here around the sun. And if in that particular star system they're able to measure the density of planets, and discover that there seems to be a very similar density gradient present in that particular star system as well, well, in that case, it does become an actual theory, and the scientists might have discovered something we never knew before. Which would of course then raise a lot of other questions. Can we somehow use this to predict structures of various planets, depending on the properties of a typical star? So definitely a lot of things to consider here. The other thing that is actually kind of interesting, and that's to me personally, is in regards to the formation of planets in our own solar system based on the graph that I showed you previously. And specifically in regards to Venus. Now in the paper they do refer to Venus as Earth analog, but technically, according to their theory, Venus should be somewhere higher up here. And so does this imply that either Earth was actually created closer to the Sun, or that Venus was created further away? Or maybe even both? And so maybe this is something that some of the future studies can actually answer as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most unusual and to some extent one of the most poorly understood comets out there, the comet known as 29P, also known as schwarzmann wachmann The comet that's technically actually not a comet at all, and instead seems to be a gigantic cryovolcano, basically a space volcano. And just recently, the scientists studying this comet have reported that it's undergoing one of the brightest outbursts it's ever had. Or in other words, it's having one of the largest volcanic emissions on its surface. And so in this video, I wanted to briefly discuss what exactly we think is happening on this object, what sort of an object this is to begin with, and more importantly, why all of this is happening, and also why this comet looks so different from every other comet we have in a solar system. And to begin, let's start by locating this particular object. As you can see from this map right here, it's located just a little bit past Jupiter. And with a size of about 60 kilometers in diameter, it's basically a really, really large ice bowl. But because of the location in the solar system, this particular comet is also classified as a centaur. 
And the centaur in this case is usually some sort of a minor planet, or basically a relatively large asteroid, whose orbit is somewhere between some of the outer planets, between Jupiter, between Saturn, Neptune and Uranus. And today the scientists believe that there are a lot of centaurs out there, possibly millions of them, but only some of them have been discovered to date, and pretty much all of them have relatively unstable orbits with some of them only staying in these orbits for maybe maximum a million years. And this means that at some point they're going to relocate somewhere else. Some of them might become moons, so for example it's believed that the moon Phoebe, moon of Saturn, was actually a centaur before, and other ones might relocate into the asteroid belt. There's also a suggestion that Ceres, the very large dwarf planet, was also a centaur a long time ago. But some centaurs have very unusual properties, and this is actually how they were found. Some of them, approximately 30 or so, exhibit cometary properties. Or they basically start having cometary tails and produce emissions, making them much more visible than before. But only three centaurs are able to do so beyond the orbit of Jupiter. The other ones only do so when they're much, much closer in the solar system. And one of these cometary centaurs is 29P. But it doesn't actually produce the cometary tails for the same reason that a typical comet does or actually doesn't even have a cometary tail at all. It really sort of looks like this really large puffed up ice ball. And interestingly enough, a lot of these particles then, because of the gravity, sort of fall back to the surface to potentially restart the cycle again. And since originally 29P was discovered back in 1927, the scientists for decades now have been able to establish a somewhat predictable pattern of its emissions. And so here's, for example, some of the most recent pictures taken in uh, September and October of 2021. And you can even see the volcanic eruptions happening in these regions right here. Okay, I keep calling it a volcano, but that's actually not correct. It doesn't really have any of these properties of a typical volcano on Earth. A more proper way of calling this would be a cryovolcano. A cryovolcano, like the ones we've seen on, for example, Enceladus, is essentially an eruption of what you would call cryomagma. Now it could be liquid water as you can see in this particular image, but it can also be a lot of other liquid elements, for example liquid methane, liquid ethylene, or any other liquid hydrocarbons like the ones we've discovered on for example a Titan or some of the other objects. For example here's one potential cryovolcano on the surface of Ceres. This one has been studied in a lot of detail, but no eruption has ever been seen. Here's another one also from Ceres as well. But the one that's been studied the most is the grainy volcano you see right here, this is also from Titan, the cryovolcano known as the Doom Mons, named after the iconic mountain from the Lord of the Rings. But 59P right here seems to be the most active cryovolcano we have in the solar system. In September alone it erupted at least four times, reaching the highest magnitude it's ever had, or basically producing some of the most active eruptions. Which means that this is the most energetic outburst this comet has had in the last few decades. And as always you can find some of the best images in regards to cometary eruption right here on Twitter. This is from Adrian Sonka from the Berthold Observatory and right here you can kind of see how tremendously powerful this emission was. And this is just one of these eruptions. Within about two days four different eruptions occurred, releasing a pretty large amount of material and producing quite a lot of energy. And in total there are at least six different locations, or technically six different volcanic mouths, present on the surface of this object. You can obviously see the origin of some of them just from this picture alone. And when these eruptions occur, they occur extremely fast. All of this happens in just a few hours and increases the total luminosity of the comet sometimes up to about 250 times, so basically it becomes 250 times brighter. But whatever is happening to the comet now is a little bit unusual. Normally it only has about 7 to 8 eruptions per year. It doesn't often have so many eruptions happening all at once. But there is a periodicity to these eruptions, which also explains how all of this works. The period here is about 57 days. Or in other words, major eruptions happen every 57 days. And this periodicity is most likely caused by the fact that this comet is spinning, but unlike other objects, it's spinning very, very slow. The majority of comets out there normally take approximately a few hours to maybe a maximum a day to complete a single rotation. This one doesn't. It takes roughly around 57 days, which in the end produces relatively long days and relatively long nights. And so during that one month of nighttime on the comet, so basically in the darkness here, 
a lot of the gas that escaped from the previous eruptions or a lot of the gas present in some of the other parts of the comet because of the extremely cold conditions on the dark side of this comet ends up moving lower and lower beneath the surface and very likely deposits into various pools or various chambers that then forms a lot of these large pockets of gas that sort of get sealed as the comet cools down and as the surface becomes harder. And so within about 30 days, the material that was emitted slowly falls back to the surface, then gets deposited underneath the surface of the comet, creating these relatively large deposits that very likely also become liquid because of the low temperatures. With two major gases being nitrogen and carbon monoxide. Both of them, when they freeze, can basically pile up on the surface and slowly make their way toward the center. And so for approximately 30 days or so, all of this gets deposited underneath. But then the day happens, and so when the sun comes out, the temperature starts to increase. And just like with the volcano here on Earth, this pressure then leads to the eruption, which unlike in typical comets, happens very suddenly. Normally in comets, the tails sort of gradually build up, but here all of this occurs extremely suddenly. Once again, this image right here sort of demonstrates this pretty well. And so the periodicity of this is due to the rotation of the comet. But one of the reasons it's been happening for the past few decades, and it's going to be happening for many years to come, is really because of the size and the mass of this comet. Because it's anywhere from about 40 to 60 kilometers in diameter, it has just enough mass to attract all of this gas released back to its surface. And so it basically restarts the cycle every 57 days. Obviously, some of the material gets to escape, but the majority falls back to the surface. But it's also believed that the cryovolcanoes themselves change over time, and some of the material as it falls to the surface has a chance to actually break the surface, creating new volcanic mouths. And so there are definitely a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to this comet, its activity, and cryovolcanism in general. And unfortunately, to date, this particular comet, despite being extremely unique and very different from anything else we have in the solar system, has not really been studied that well and did not receive enough attention from some of the scientists. Being the most exciting cryovolcano in the solar system, this definitely deserves a lot more attention. And since a lot of this material in the comet is also believed to be the primordial stuff that formed billions and billions of years ago, this would be a perfect opportunity to study some of the oldest material in the solar system by basically just capturing it right next to the comet. And because a lot of this stuff is also organic molecules, this makes this an even more interesting opportunity. But unfortunately, to date, there is really no mission planned at all. Hopefully, this will change in time. But since, unlike other comets, this one is a centaur, it also means that, as I mentioned, its orbit is unstable. Today, the scientists believe that by the year 4000, it's going to migrate into an entirely different region and thus very likely stop being what it is today. It's going to stop being a cryovolcano. It might move somewhere to the outskirts and become something entirely different, or it might move closer to the um, inner solar system and fall apart completely. So in other words, it only has maybe about 2000 years to go before it completely changes and disappears. Nevertheless, at this moment, it's one of the most interesting objects in the solar system and is the most active cryovolcano we have. Basically a space volcano erupting several times per year. With the biggest eruption, for some reason, happening now. And why exactly this eruption is more powerful than previous ones is obviously not really known right now. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the gigantic neighbor, Jupiter and the resolution to one of the biggest mysteries of this planet. The mystery being this right here, the aurora on Jupiter. Up until now, nobody actually knew exactly how the aurora on Jupiter is being generated. This was one of the biggest mysteries, unanswered mysteries, for the past few decades. And even though we know how the aurora is generally created on planets like Earth and even planets like Mars, the mysterious aurora on Jupiter still did not really make sense, once again, until now. So let's discuss this in today's video, and let's actually find out how the aurora on gas giants, despite the visual similarity, is actually very different from the aurora we have on planet Earth. And so first of all, how are the aurora or northern slash southern lights generated on planet Earth? Now this mystery the scientists have solved a long time ago. We know that these beautiful lights are generated in a relatively simple way. Planet Earth has a magnetosphere, a relatively powerful one compared to some of the other planets. And the magnetosphere of our planet is formed by these magnetic lines you see right here. 
But once in a while, when our sun experiences some sort of an outburst, such as a solar flare, and a lot of particles are released from the surface of the sun, as these particles make their way toward planet Earth, some of them get deflected by the magnetic field, but some of them end up being trapped by the magnetic lines and follow the lines all the way to the south and the north pole, striking the planet right here in this region. And as these charged particles from the sun strike the planet, or more specifically strike the atmosphere of the planet, they end up creating these beautiful formations in the night skies. And depending on what particle they strike, they'll create different colors. And since the atmosphere is mostly composed of oxygen and nitrogen, those are usually the particles responsible for most of the colors. For example, here's an aurora produced by the excitation of nitrogen, whereas here's the one where it's mostly oxygen. But because of where the magnetic lines connect to our planet, on Earth, pretty much most of the aurora usually take place between 65 and 80 degrees of latitude, corresponding to the location where the magnetic lines kind of enter our planet. And because of this, certain latitudes will never actually have aurora, unless, of course, it's an extremely powerful event from the Sun, such as the famous Carrington event that happened in the 1800s and supposedly produced aurora even in the Caribbean. Nevertheless, you're not going to see aurora in certain regions of the planet. At the same time, normally the northern lights usually correspond to the southern lights. In other words, it's sort of like a mirror image of one another. Which is once again related to how solar flares are captured by the magnetic lines of our planet and how they propagate all the way to the planet itself. But that's on Earth. The thing is, it doesn't seem to work on Jupiter and on Saturn, and also possibly other gas giants as well. As a matter of fact, the aurora there seemed to be very different, with first major mystery discovered decades ago being the fact that the northern aurora does not really correspond to the one in the south. They do seem to be very different, and they also seem to occur at different times. At the same time, they also seem to be different in power, which is not something we ever see on Earth. Moreover, the aurora and Jupiter are able to be formed way, way past the 80 degree line, essentially right at the North Pole or right at the South Pole, something that does not happen on our own planet. And so this right here is once again a mystery. It's almost impossible or was almost impossible to explain how this could actually occur on this beautiful planet. Now, it was still believed that this was obviously something to do with ions striking the atmosphere. As a matter of fact, today we believe that if a planet has magnetosphere and if it also has some sort of an atmosphere, it very likely will also have aurora on the surface. But the actual mechanism could be entirely different, and it seems to be different for Jupiter. And trying to figure out this mystery was a priority for many, many decades. Now, first of all, it's important to understand that Jupiter is an extreme planet with an extremely powerful magnetic field. So powerful as a matter of fact that if you could actually see it, it would sort of look like this from planet Earth. And interestingly, it's so huge in terms of size that it seems to even reach all the way to the orbit of Saturn. Because of this, the aurora produced on Jupiter have a tremendous amount of power, gigawatts of power, way, way more power than anything here on planet Earth. And on top of this, the aurora on Jupiter also seem to come in different flavors. Jupiter also seems to have powerful X-ray aurora and very powerful ultraviolet aurora as well, all of which might have a different creation story. But in this paper, the scientists decided to focus on trying to figure out how the X-ray aurora created by trying to combine the observations from two different observatories. The X-ray observatory known as XMM Newton orbiting planet Earth and various observations from the Juno mission currently orbiting Jupiter. And so what exactly did the scientists discover and what exactly is the solution to this problem? Well, to try to solve this, they had to first create a model. And the model in this case focuses on assuming that Jupiter's magnetic lines emanate from one part of the planet, going millions and millions of kilometers away to then be rejoined on the other side of the planet without ever really being connected to the solar activity or to the solar magnetic field in any way. And so because the magnetic field here is so extremely powerful, it's sort of independent of the magnetic field that's normally caused by the solar wind coming from the sun. And so here the scientists in this paper were able to use approximately 26 hours of data from the XMM Newton telescope combined with the data from the Juno mission as well. And the first thing they were able to notice is that there was a very unusual but also very periodic pulsation every 27 minutes that was detectable by both of the missions. Pulsations that indicated that the aurora themselves were very likely being generated by changes in the magnetic field of Jupiter. 
And with every single pulsation detected by the Juno mission, the change in the magnetosphere, that's when the XMM Newton was able to detect the unusual X-ray aurora that was then visible on the surface of Jupiter. Or in other words, this right here was very likely caused by the changes in the magnetic field itself, which also implied that the aurora here are generated because of the changes in the magnetosphere, or essentially unusual fluctuations in the magnetic lines of Jupiter. But what was causing this? And more importantly, where were the charged particles coming from? Well, further analysis suggested that a lot of these particles, which are most likely various charged ions of sulfur and oxygen, are almost certainly coming from eruptions on Io, the beautiful volcanic moon of Jupiter. Io is known to erupt all the time, and it's also known to produce a lot of other formations around Jupiter, including one of the potential rings. But more importantly, it releases a tremendous amount of ions that are then very likely deposited in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And this activity is very likely the reason for the aurora we are observing. But one thing to note here is that these ions are just stuck in the magnetic field of Jupiter and normally just kind of stay in the magnetic lines without really doing anything. So something must happen in order for all of these ions to suddenly start converging on the poles of Jupiter in order to suddenly create these beautiful formations we refer to as aurora. And the scientists believe that the sudden motion of sulfur and oxygen is very likely caused by some sort of a pressure, most likely due to the solar wind that does reach Jupiter as well. And the pressure from the solar wind sort of compresses the magnetic lines just a little bit, producing what the scientists refer to as modulated EMIC waves, electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves. And so this compression that's caused by the solar wind initiates a kind of a motion of all of the sulfur and oxygen ions, with each of them striking the atmosphere of Jupiter at different times in different regions. And because the magnetic lines on Jupiter are so tremendously large and are millions and millions of kilometers in size, some of these sulfur and oxygen ions will take quite a while to get there. And so this is one of the reasons why the actual aurora form at different times and in different regions. But these observations also imply one more thing. These aurora are probably created in a slightly different way on other planets, including Saturn. On Saturn, the actual ions are not sulfur or oxygen. They're actually, most likely, ions of water, because they usually come from Enceladus. Enceladus is responsible for releasing a tremendous amount of water into the regions around Saturn, and a lot of the water particles will also get ionized and then get deposited into the magnetic lines of Saturn. And so the assumption right now is that something extremely similar very likely happens around Saturn, and something extremely similar probably happens around other gas giants and, of course, other exoplanets. But the important takeaway from all of this is that aurora seem to be created in different ways on different planets. In a very different way, as a matter of fact. I've already discussed how the aurora on Mars are generated in one of the previous videos, but compared to Martian aurora, these ones are created in a very different way altogether. Which of course also means that it would be really interesting to one day find out how all of this is generated on some other planets out there as well. Although for now, it's still quite exciting to find out that after around 40 years of research, the scientists have finally figured out the exact mechanism responsible for the generation of X-ray aurora on Jupiter, a mystery that's been bugging them for many, many years. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to try to once again talk about the definition of planets. Planets like Mars. And planets like Earth. But also, planets like Io right here. But wait, Anton, Io is not a planet, it's a moon. It's a moon of Jupiter. Or is it? So today we're actually going to be discussing this relatively intriguing study, the study that, as always, you can find in the description below, that argues a point that a lot of planetary scientists agree with. Our current definition of what a planet is, is actually somewhat wrong. As a matter of fact, it's somewhat unscientific. In a sense that it borrows a lot of ideas from astrology and not from actual astronomy. And back in 2006, when the International Astronomical Union officiated this definition, that's when, unfortunately, objects like Pluto lost their definition of being a planet, which, first of all, obviously upset a lot of people, 
But second of all, as the scientists in this paper claim, was actually done extremely rushed for basically unscientific reasons, and more importantly, used some really unusual features to define what a planet actually is. Now, as you might already know, there are three main features that an object has to possess, according to this definition, to be a planet. First of all, it obviously has to orbit some sort of a star. In our case, it would be the Sun. Second of all, it has to have enough mass to turn spherical. We usually refer to this as hydrostatic equilibrium. And so far, by this definition, Pluto is still a planet. But then there is also another definition that sort of changed everything. It has to have an ability to clear the neighborhood of other potential objects orbiting in the same uh, vicinity. Now, this is where it gets really tricky. The reason why International Astronomical Union and some other scientists do not think Pluto is considered to be a planet is because once in a while it does actually kind of cross the orbit of Neptune, at least if you were to look at this in three dimensions. Here's actually what the orbit looks like roughly, and as you can see it does once in a while pass relatively close to the Sun, even closer than Neptune. And at the same time several other objects were discovered around the same time in 2006, Objects like Eris, for example, that you see right here, that are even slightly more massive than Pluto and are even farther away than Pluto. When the scientists originally discovered this, this was supposed to be the 10th planet. But over time they found more similar objects such as Sedna, Oumuamua and so on. And because of this, they realized that these objects might just not be planets. Today we refer to them as dwarf planets. And so the argument here was that, well, now the kids in school will have to memorize too many planets for the solar system. And although it does maybe make sense to some extent, it really doesn't make sense for one major reason. It's not a good definition. It's a definition that sort of defines an object simply by its orbit and is only based on one single feature. We normally refer to this as planetary dynamics, basically the orbits of planets. It does actually consider what the object is by itself on the inside. And the scientists in this paper make a really good comparison here. It's as if we define a mammal based on where the animal lived and how it moved, not based on the actual genetics or essentially the biology of the animal. For example, would an animal be a mammal if it moved in large groups and lived on land? Well, obviously it sort of defines horses that you see right here, but then again we have mammals living in the water and we have some mammals living completely by themselves. So the motion or the movement of the object should not really be the defining feature of a certain object. In other words, we should not be defining planets simply by their orbit. And that's why we shouldn't really be defining planets this way. And ironically, most planetary scientists, most um, scientists working with planets, usually accept a completely different definition, independent of what IAU decided in 2006. This definition is generally referred to as the geological definition of planets. And unlike the dynamical definition of planets, it focuses entirely on the activity on and inside this particular object. And by this definition, a planet is a geologically active substellar body. It can be a satellite. And in addition to eight planets that we already know of, these include a lot of dwarf planets, including Eris and Pluto, but also certain planetary moons as well, including our own moon and including many moons around Jupiter. And generally, this particular definition sees the planets this way. We have five terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon and Mars. We have giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. But then we also have quite a lot of different satellite and dwarf planets, with nearly 150 of them in existence. And so, in some sense, I guess this would be somewhat difficult to remember, especially if you're just learning about astronomy. But on the other hand, as a young child, you would actually be fascinated with this idea. The idea that there are 150 different objects out there, with many of them with strange names, many of them containing extremely different properties from what we would find on planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, having taught many children before, when I actually told them this, well, most of them were absolutely excited to learn about it. They were not afraid to learn their names. But that's of course beside the point. Well, okay, let's step back a little bit. Let's actually talk a little bit more about how we came to the current definition that the IAU accepted back in 2006 which also directly connects to the point being made in this paper. So first of all, we know that the idea of planets and the definition of planets has actually existed for thousands of years. One of the first mentions of planet as an astronomical object and the attempt to define them can actually be found in a lot of different tablets left from the Babylonian Empire 
that existed approximately 3,000 years ago, with this tablet right here, known as the Venus Tablet of Amisa Duqua, representing the first official observations of the motions of planet Venus, with some other tablets also talking about other planets as well. Although in this case we really are talking about the so-called five classical planets that are visible with the naked eye. We're talking about Mercury, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. Neither Uranus nor Neptune were visible or known to these cultures. But what exactly were these tablets for and what was mentioned inside of them? Well, the main purpose of these tablets was astrological. They were sort of describing the motions of different objects in the night skies and then trying to associate all of this with a list of omens, a list of relationship between various celestial phenomena and potentially even mythology itself and religious practices. In other words, a lot of this was used for prediction purposes or to see if something could occur if there was a certain alignment in the night skies. Which is also the basis for Western astrology today as well. So a lot of the Western astrology based their ideas on a lot of these ancient Babylonian practices. And then with the invention of modern telescope, two more planets were discovered and in 1931, Pluto. Although according to the initial observations, this object was really, really big. It was even believed to be bigger than the planet Earth. But because of the discovery of Eris and a lot of other trans-Neptunian objects, that's when the scientists, some scientists, proposed a new clause to the definition of planets that involved that orbital parameter where the planet has to clear its neighborhood. Which of course creates its own issue as well. What exactly is a neighborhood? For example, when it comes to the closest approach of Pluto to Neptune, the approach here is about 16 AU, which is 16 times the distance of Sun to planet Earth. Now that's pretty far away. And although in this simulation you see that it does actually cross the orbit of Neptune, that's obviously only if you look from the top. Here's roughly what it sort of looks like from the top view. But if we were to look at this in three dimensions, you'll notice that it actually doesn't come close to Neptune at all. And so a lot of these little things made this decision extremely controversial and made a lot of planetologists quite upset. The majority of planetologists do not seem to accept that definition, including a lot of major NASA scientists. And that actually includes the primary investigator behind the New Horizons probe, the probe that uh, reached Pluto, the iconic Alan Stern. Furthermore, this paper goes into a little bit more history, definitively showing that the current definition of planets seems to be entirely based on this Western astrology and more specifically seems to be based on what they refer to as the almanacs. So sort of like the astrology you find in modern newspapers. Here the predictions were simply based on the position of planets in the night skies and were then trying to imply that something is going to happen. These publications were extremely popular in the 19th century and early 20th century and because of this the scientists believe that a lot of the modern planetary definitions came from these ideas, these astrological ideas, that simply saw the planets as something moving in the night skies with a certain orbit around the sun, not actual objects with actual properties. But more importantly, prior to the 19th century, there was actually a geophysical definition of a planet established by Galileo Galilei himself. A planet had to be a geologically active object, and this is indeed what a lot of planetary scientists are trying to push for as well. They're trying to move away from this astrological definition involving orbits to a definition that involves a property of an object and more specifically geological activity on the object. So in other words, a planet is an object with complex geological activity on the surface, somewhat independent of the actual orbit around the star system. And more specifically because these orbits can be extremely different. The scientists here give another example. If suddenly a star comes into the solar system and disrupts our solar system, a lot of the objects that were previously planets might not be planets anymore because they're going to be orbiting in a very different way and potentially not have these stable orientations anymore. So does that mean that if something disrupts planet Earth, it's not going to be a planet anymore? Well, if it finds itself in, for example, an orbit crossing Jupiter, by this definition, the answer is no. But according to Galileo Galilei and a lot of modern planetary scientists, it's still a planet because it's geologically active. And because Pluto is also geologically active, with one of the recent papers even discovering that the iconic feature on Pluto known as Sputnik Planitia is actually formed geologically through a process of sublimation of nitrogen, furthermore establishes that according to the geophysical definition, Pluto is indeed a planet after all. 
And that's actually despite the point that Pluto is so far away from the Sun that the Sun should not be causing any kind of sublimation. So it's definitely driven by some kind of a geological activity on the inside. In other words, it's really important for an object to have internal properties and a lot of internal activity in order to be classified as one of these planets. And so the main proposition here is not to have a simply defined eight planets, which by the way are already quite different from one another, but to instead have different categories of planets with dramatically different properties on the inside. With I guess one major change being the moon is now a planet. It's a terrestrial planet. And that of course makes sense because the moon, the satellite of planet Earth, is way bigger and more influential on planet Earth than any other moon in orbit of any other major planet including Jupiter and Saturn. Which also means that Earth and Moon is technically a binary planetary system. And when it comes to simplifying the idea of learning planets and learning their names in for example young children, teaching school children to understand the diversity of the universe and of course the diversity of planets in our solar system is way way more important than just teaching them eight names of eight different planets and kind of calling it quits after that. And so in that sense, the scientists in this paper make a really strong argument. And as the scientists mention in the paper, in general, planets in any orbital state are unique as engines of complexity in the cosmos. And that line by itself is very difficult to argue with. You cannot simply say something is a planet just because it's moving around the night skies in a certain way. You really have to look at the internal structure of this object, you have to see what's happening on the inside and the outside, and then determine its physical properties in order to establish what sort of an object it is. With this right here still being the best geophysical definition of a planet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a pretty exciting new discovery coming from our own solar system. A discovery from something that existed in the solar system approximately 4.5 billion years ago. And that discovery is also apparent in the rings of Saturn that you see right here. It seems that the early solar system, when it was still forming planets and when it used to have the protoplanetary disk, contained a major gap just like the rings of Saturn you see right here. But this finding has a lot of other implications other than just being a gap itself. It actually solves a major mystery. So let's talk a little bit more about this, including why these gaps form, and also what these gaps usually produce. But let's start right here. This is a really famous image of a star system known as GW Orionis. We've discussed this star system in one of the previous videos that's going to be popping up somewhere right there at some point. GW Orionis, or GW Ori for short, is extremely intriguing for various reasons. One of the major reasons is actually because of the amount of dust rings it contains on the inside and their overall inclination to one another. I know the typical protoplanetary disk contains something similar to this, and it usually just has a single disk in a similar plane of orbit. GW Ori contains three disks with three separate orbits. And as a result, it's probably going to have three extremely different types of planets once they end up forming. But the thing is, pretty much most of the protoplanetary disks that have been studied so far normally contain quite a lot of gaps on the inside. Gaps reminiscent to what we also observe in the rings of Saturn. Now we know that for Saturn, for example, and for a lot of other objects that contain large gaps, that's usually because they have planets forming or small moons forming that sort of end up absorbing a lot of the matter and leaving gaps behind, which is by the way one of the ways for us to find potential planets in other young planetary systems. But even though a lot of these objects contain gaps, not all of them are produced by planets. Currently some of these gaps are actually kind of difficult to explain. In other words, not every gap here is going to have a planet there, some of them are going to be entirely empty. And we've discussed something similar with the GW Ori system, where the scientists proposed that some of these gaps can actually be formed by the interaction between partner stars. In other words, some of this can also be formed through various gravitational interactions. On the other hand, if we go back to the solar system, and if we start looking around and looking for different objects and different, I guess, differences in those objects, we'll discover some unusual peculiar properties. So one very common question slash very common property becomes obvious in this image right here. There's an unusual divide between the types of objects that we have in the solar system. We have the terrestrial planets, although in this case this also includes our moon, 
Then we have these giant planets, which are also known as gas giants. And then we have everything else, including dwarf planets and including moons of gas giants. And here the common question is, well, why does this divide exist? Why is it that we have terrestrial planets and gas giants? Because this doesn't exist in all of the star systems we've seen so far. And in some star systems, entirely different planets also occupy their own category that doesn't exist in the solar system. And then there's another mystery. The mystery of various meteorites and various asteroids we've been discovering across the solar system. This mystery has a name. It's known as the isotopic dichotomy. The most recent paper about this particular topic is in the description below. So isotopic dichotomy refers to the unusual parameters inside the asteroids and inside meteorites that suggests that various asteroids seem to have one of two isotope combinations. And almost all of the meteorites we've discovered so far will either have one type of isotopes in them or will have a completely other type. It's very, very rarely that we found a meteorite that has both. So there's basically like this grouping, either you have these types of isotopes or you'll have other types. And this dichotomy becomes even more apparent when looking at two separate types of asteroids, with one of the types known as carbonaceous chondrite and the other one known as the non-carbonaceous chondrite. They're also sometimes known as CC and NC for short. And so this NC-CC dichotomy has been known for a very long time, but it's really only recently the scientists started to realize it's really because these different meteorites were created in completely different spots of the solar system. But this was just a hypothesis and it needed more proof. As a matter of fact, it needed a lot of proof. And so the recent paper goes in a lot more detail, pretty much establishing exactly what a lot of scientists believed for a very long time. There was a really large gap in the solar system and this gap created conditions necessary for very specific planets to form. On the one side of the gap we had the terrestrial planets, on the other side we had the gas giants and a lot of other objects, including dwarf planets. With the gap itself very likely existing for maybe a few million years, approximately 4.567 billion years ago. And because many similar gaps have been observed in a lot of other star systems, it totally makes sense. But what exactly formed it? Well, at the moment there are two possible scenarios, but even these are not really certain yet. The first scenario involves a massive planet, but probably not Saturn. As Jupiter grew in size and became bigger and bigger, it also started to push a lot of the gas, creating a larger and larger gap. And as it moved across the solar system, the gap sort of stayed behind with Jupiter just ending up in a different location. On the other hand, this could also be because of the disk itself. Maybe Jupiter had nothing to do with this. And so the second explanation involves the disk. In this case, as the disk itself starts to coalesce and becomes more powerful, it also starts emitting its own winds. And these winds form simply because of the relatively powerful magnetic fields that are normally present inside these disks. But these winds can be powerful enough to start emitting so much radiation that a lot of the mass starts to sort of disappear or moves to a different location. This can also lead to a production of relatively large gaps. So some of these gaps in this particular disk could have actually been created through these very powerful winds produced by the disk itself. And once the gap forms, it literally acts as a kind of a boundary. It's very difficult to go through this gap. And so whatever is on one side of the gap starts to accrete and form one type of an object. On the other side of the gap, you'll have a completely other type of an object, which in our solar system led to the formation of terrestrial planets and gas giants. And because it would be somewhat difficult for any planetary object to cross the gap, it would actually require a lot of energy and quite a lot of momentum to move from one region to the other. That's why we mostly have gas giants on one side and terrestrial planets on the other side. And in this case, even the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are very different in composition to our own moon. For the most part, all of these moons contain a lot of ices on the inside. Our moon, however, is mostly terrestrial, which once again suggests that they were produced in very different locations of the solar system. But then we have this recent paper that you can find in the description below that has gone even a step farther. They were able to successfully show that the reason why these different meteorites exist is really because of this gap. And this gap definitely explains the origin of various types of planets. 
essentially providing even more direct proof for the existence of something like this in the early solar system. The way that they prove this is by analyzing the magnetic fields of various asteroids. In this case, the team behind this paper analyzed the signs of different magnetic fields that were present when the meteorites were formed and essentially looked at various changes created by the magnetic fields inside the tiny particles that were present inside meteorites. Here we're talking about particles that are usually known as chondrules. Chondrules are these tiny formations present in some of the meteorites, or actually in most of the meteorites, and generally various electrons inside these chondrules will actually be aligned with the magnetic field that was present in the early solar system. And so by directly measuring the alignment inside the chondrules of various meteorites, they were able to work out the approximate magnetic field that was present when these particular meteorites were formed. Specifically comparing the carbonaceous chondrite to the non-carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. So basically those meteorites that have this dichotomy. And to their surprise they discovered that the meteorites that were carbonaceous in nature and that were most likely made farther away from the sun, anywhere between 3 to maybe 7 astronomical units, seem to contain approximately double the magnetic field of some of the non-carbonaceous meteorites that were studied in previous studies that were also made much closer to the sun, or essentially where Earth, Mars and the Moon were created. But normally, we expect the magnetic field to sort of decrease equally away from the sun. We don't expect it to suddenly increase farther away from the sun. And the increase here was quite dramatic. The magnetic field for the closer non-carbonaceous chondrites was approximately 50 microtesla. That's actually very similar to the magnetic field of planet Earth right now. But these distant carbonaceous chondrites had approximately double the magnetic field, about 100 microtesla. And to the scientists behind this paper, this implied, well, really two things. One is that there was a lot of accretion going on which created much more powerful magnetic fields, which is also the reason why we ended up getting a lot of massive planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And so in other words, this suggests that the outskirts of the solar system here had a really, really large amount of accretion, which also created very powerful magnetic fields in comparison to the inner region. This also very likely produced extremely powerful winds, which then also probably produced the gap that we observe from various studies. Which of course altogether kind of makes sense and explains a lot of things about the solar system. It explains why we have two different types of asteroids, at least in terms of isotopic composition. It also explains why we have two major types of planets, terrestrial and gas giants, and it also explains why the magnetic field in the early solar system was slightly stronger on the outskirts compared to the inner part of the solar system where planets like Earth would develop early on. And so in this case, the outer region of the solar system was probably just experiencing a lot more accretion which created much more powerful magnetic fields. And this also means that something similar very likely happens in a lot of other star systems which can also probably answer the question of how various types of planets form in other systems as well. For example, some of the planets that don't exist in the solar system, such as many Neptunes, super-Earths, hot Jupiters and so on, these planets very likely were created differently in other star systems because of somewhat similar reasons. Probably because of the interaction of the early planetary disk and various gaps that existed in these star systems as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a new study that might give us a little bit more idea about how the early solar system was created, and more specifically, how many and what kind of supernova were responsible for, well, basically creating us as well. You might have heard this before that, you know, we're all stardust, we're all made out of really ancient supernova that exploded a long time ago and basically spread their material across vast regions of space with some of this material eventually creating our own planet and some of that material later creating us as well. For example, this table of elements right here kind of shows you where a lot of the elements are from and how they were formed. Hydrogen and helium along with some lithium are the only things that were born in the beginning of the universe. A lot of the other stuff was created either through the explosion of stars or through some other major cataclysmic events. So for example, everything you see in gold, or in this color right here, that's basically very large, very massive stars undergoing type 2 supernova. 
sometimes also known as core collapse supernova, and that's when a massive star basically explodes and then leaves behind some sort of a remnant, such as a neutron star or a black hole. And a lot of other elements, specifically stuff you see right here that's in grayish-white color, that's exploding white dwarfs or type 1 supernova. Usually this happens when a white dwarf gets enough mass from its partner or possibly from another white dwarf that it collides with, and that usually results in a really large, really powerful explosion that often is used for a lot of scientific reasons as well because it tends to produce the same amount of energy. These type 1a supernova were responsible for creating other elements. Here's actually what the typical nebula looks like after this explosion occurs. But there are actually several other sources of elements as well. For example, merging neutron stars, which brought a lot of gold and platinum, cosmic rays, which brought a lot of lithium, beryllium and boron, and even some other unusual cataclysmic events, which might have brought even more materials. So trying to figure out where all of the stuff in, for example, our bodies came from, has actually been always a curiosity for a lot of scientists. But in order to try to understand what happened in the beginning of the solar system and where the material came from, one of the major ways scientists usually do this is by using various meteorites and by then trying to find different ratios of different isotopes inside of those meteorites in order to establish certain age of certain particles. One of the reasons meteorites are preferred for this is because they actually didn't change much in the last few billions of years as they orbited around the solar system. Stuff here on Earth does change because of chemical reactions, but if you were to take a meteorite that stayed in outer space for 4 billion years, it's most likely going to be very similar to how it originally was when the solar system was just created. But first, very briefly about isotopes, with the example here being hydrogen. Normally, if you were to take an element such as hydrogen and expose this element to a lot of radiation such as, for example, in a supernova, it will start acquiring extra neutrons on the inside, thus increasing its weight and creating what's known as isotopes. These isotopes are not stable though, and with time they will actually lose this extra neutron, eventually turning into something else. Now one such famous example is based on uranium lead dating, and it's when we take uranium-238 and try to measure the ratio between that uranium and another element known as lead-206. We know that after about 4.47 billion years, half of the uranium will actually turn into lead. This is a very well studied and well established fact, and though somewhat complex, kind of looks like this. There's basically this really long chain of elements turning from one to another until eventually after this long series, it all ends up as the atom known as lead 206, and this one here is stable and will no longer change. Knowing this fact, we can actually use this to start measuring the age of different rocks. And that's basically how uranium dating works. Because we know that after about 4.47 billion years, half of this uranium become that particular lead particle, by measuring the ratio we can usually very accurately estimate the age of rocks. Which by the way was one of the isotopes used in this study. But naturally there are other isotopes we can use for even more precision, specifically ones that have much shorter half-life. And more specifically in this paper, they used one isotope that's now officially extinct. This one right here, known as Niobium-92, which eventually ends up being the atom known as Zirconium-92, which is the stable part of this chain. Now, the thing about Niobium-92 is that it's only extinct because its half-life is only about 37 million years. But that type of a half-life is actually perfect to study certain events, such as the creation of the solar system, and trying to actually investigate how things changed in the early solar system. But in order to make this work, the scientists obviously have to take several different isotopes from the same sample and then compare their ratios in order to create some sort of an accurate timeline of how things went and how things changed over time in that particular period. Because remember, we're currently right here, we're about 4.5 billion years after the creation of the solar system, and the scientists are interested in studying this right here, the birth of the solar system. And mostly because the scientists really want to find out what sort of supernova were responsible for adding a lot of different elements to the solar system. And so the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below were able to combine these isotopes and used a completely untouched by nature pristine sample of zircon that was actually discovered inside one of the meteorites known as Vestoids. 
The meteorite that originally came from the larger object known as Vesta, the protoplanet that never really became a planet. Now we know that these objects are pristine and, for the most part, are kind of untouched by anything, and because of this, samples from Vesta have always been kind of interesting for scientists studying the early solar system. And so by studying these particular rocks, they were able to establish how much of this extinct element of 92 niobium existed in the early solar system, thus allowing them to see how things changed early on and what kind of early events influenced the solar system when the planets were just created. And so by studying these particular rocks, the scientists were able to establish how much of that extinct niobium 92 existed in the early solar system and thus how the solar system evolved and what sort of events, what sort of supernova influenced various parts of the solar system. And according to the scientists, because these minerals that they used in the study were basically pristine and untouched, they were the perfect opportunity to determine how much of that extinct niobium existed in the early solar system. And so by using these Vestoid meteorites, they were able to improve the so-called 9292 niobium zirconium chronometer, which then allowed them to date the early solar system much more accurately which in theory would provide precise information about the formation of all of these early objects, including asteroids and uh, early planetoids, in the early solar system. But for this particular study, what they discovered was essentially that the inner solar system, the part where Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury are located, were actually largely influenced by Type 1a supernova. And so that's of course the type when there's a white dwarf involved and possibly another star where the white dwarf basically captures its mass or another white dwarf that it collides with. So something like this happens in the relative vicinity of the solar system approximately four and a half billion years ago and then delivered a lot of this material to the solar system and a lot of this stuff basically made our planets. However, it's also possible that this is something that might have happened a long time ago because a lot of these elements could have come from a completely different part of the galaxy. On the other hand, the outer part of the solar system, the part where Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus and a lot of other stuff is, were influenced by type 2 supernova. And that's the core collapse supernova when massive stars, very likely located not so far away from where the solar system was forming, basically collapsed, exploded, and created really large amounts of gas and a lot of different materials that essentially got enriched through the radiation from the supernova and then ended up in the outer regions of the solar system. Which of course totally makes sense because if we were to look at other molecular clouds such as the Orion Nebula where a lot of stars are being created right now as well, we know that a lot of this gas came from various supernova in the past. And a lot of the stars that are currently really massive and are still located in this region are also going to explode and basically mix all of their material with the rest of the star systems forming there. Some of these star systems are probably going to become similar to the solar system, with a lot of this material eventually forming planets, comets, asteroids, and so on. And so in that sense, it's actually kind of interesting to see that the scientists for the most part figured out that there were at least two different types of supernova responsible for creating the planets and a lot of the other stuff in our own solar system. So once again, with the inner part representing the material that was created during some sort of a type 1a supernova when the white dwarf exploded, and everything else, the outer part of the solar system, being represented by a type 2 supernova, possibly even more than one. More importantly, at least one of these supernova happened during a time when the solar system was being formed. Which of course, once again confirms that, well, we are star stuff after all. A lot of the heavy elements in our bodies, or basically everything that's not hydrogen, helium, and not lithium, very likely was created in these powerful explosions happening around the early solar system about four and a half billion years ago. And this study establishes that it wasn't just one, it was at least two, but very likely a lot more. But that's something that future studies will hopefully determine with a little bit more accuracy. For now, all we know is that a lot of exciting things happen in the solar system in the beginning, and it sounds like by seeing similar events happening in the regions like the Orion's Belt, we can be pretty certain that a lot of very exciting star systems are going to be created in the future as well. And maybe at least one of them will also have some sort of an extraterrestrial intelligence one day living there and exploring the life and the universe around it. 
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this brand new discovery of a completely new asteroid that actually breaks a few records. An asteroid known as 2021 PH27. The asteroid was, as always, accidentally discovered while looking for something entirely different. And an asteroid that takes approximately 113 days to complete a single orbit around the Sun. Making this the asteroid with the shortest orbit around the Sun, and also potentially an asteroid that created a completely new group of asteroids that we didn't actually know existed. While also an asteroid that seems to possess some really extreme conditions on the surface, especially when it gets really close to the Sun. And so let's talk a little bit more about this, because a lot of these near-Mercury asteroids are quite rare, and a lot of them have also been discovered to possess really interesting properties. But first of all, how exactly was this found? This beautiful observatory in Chile known as CTIO, or Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, is part of the Dark Energy Survey that contains what's known as the DECCAM, also known as Dark Energy Camera. And even though the main purpose of the survey is to study the mystery of dark energy, it's already been able to discover some incredible objects out there completely by accident, with this recent asteroid being one of these objects. And so in mid-August, Scott Shepard, who's already known for discovering quite a lot of different minor planets, saw another unusual, never-before-seen object moving quite fast and extremely close to the Sun. This tiny, tiny dot you see right there. They only had a few days to analyze its orbit, but in that time they discovered that this seems to possess the closest orbit of all asteroids discovered so far, and based on the luminosity produced, represented an asteroid that was about 1 kilometer or maybe a little bit wider than 1 kilometer in size. With the initial calculations suggesting that it actually comes much closer to the Sun than Mercury, with the shortest distance here being about 12 million miles or about 20 million kilometers, or as you can see here, roughly around half the distance of Mercury, with the epiphelion, also known as the farthest uh, part of the orbit, taking it slightly farther than the orbit of Venus, but obviously never reaching the orbit of Earth. With the orbit sort of looking like this. Now notice how when it's really close to the Sun, it moves extremely fast. And at this point, it's also extremely hot. Currently, the belief is that the temperatures here reach about 500 degrees Celsius, or approximately 900 degrees Fahrenheit. But it only stays this hot for a few days, moving farther and farther away relatively quickly. And because it moves so fast around the Sun, it currently is invisible to us, it's actually hiding behind the Sun, so we're only going to be able to calculate its orbit even more sometime in 2022, so it will actually take a few months for it to come out to become visible again. Now, generally, it's extremely difficult to find these asteroids. With the main reason being our Sun. It sort of hides many of them. The luminosity of these asteroids is so tiny compared to our Sun that trying to find them orbiting around the Sun becomes practically impossible. As a matter of fact, they only become visible during twilight, either right before the sun comes up or right after the sunset. And even then, you have to get extremely lucky to try to capture these asteroids and to try to calculate their orbital parameters. But because many of these asteroids end up crossing planet Earth at some point as well, especially the group known as the Apollo asteroids, whose orbit you see in green right here, they represent an extremely dangerous type of an asteroid that we actually have to study really well. As a matter of fact, the famous Chelyabinsk meteor from 2013 that created a huge explosion above uh, the city of Chelyabinsk represents one of these Apollo asteroids, the asteroids that orbit very close to planet Earth and extremely close to the Sun as well. But currently there are a few more interesting facts about this asteroid. First of all, because it actually comes really close to the Sun, it ends up experiencing the highest Einsteinian precession effects. The effects that were used to explain the unusual precession of Mercury approximately 100 years ago. And so this unusual effect from the general relativity ends up shifting the orbit of this asteroid by roughly around one arc minute per century per 100 years. Now it's not a lot, but it means that after about 6,000 years, this right here will most likely be pointed this way toward about 100 degrees. And so this precession can entirely be explained by Einsteinian theory. At the same time, its orbit in general is already quite unusual and somewhat difficult to explain. Especially if we try to figure out where this object came from or what family it belongs to. So generally there are four major families of asteroids relatively close to planet Earth. We have the Apollo asteroids I mentioned previously, with roughly around 1700 of them being classified as potentially dangerous, with some chance of colliding with planet Earth in the next thousand years or so. The largest one is, by the way, Sisyphus, which is about 7 kilometers across. 
We also have the Amor asteroids that orbit around Mars and tend to only cross the orbit of Mars. But then we also have the more dangerous Aten asteroids that tend to stay in a relatively similar orbit to our own planet, as well as the Atira asteroids that tend to orbit within the orbit of planet Earth. And at the moment, this right here would classify as a Tira asteroid, but because of its unusual orbital properties, it most likely represents something entirely different. And there's actually one good reason for that. Look at this from the side. It seems to have a very large inclination of at least 30 degrees. And interestingly, even though here it looks like it comes pretty close to orbit of Mercury, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, the closest approach to Mercury is approximately 0.1 astronomical unit or approximately 50 million kilometers away. It actually comes closer to Venus once in a while, at a distance of about 2.2 million kilometers. And its orbit on top of this is not expected to be stable and most likely changed over time and will change again. Currently it's believed that it's going to actually either collide with the Sun, Mercury or possibly even Venus. Although none of this is going to be happening for the next few millions of years, it's still going to be in orbit for quite a long time. But going back to its origin, because of this really high inclination of 32 degrees, it's sort of right now suspected that this could have been some sort of a comet in the past. Possibly a comet coming from really far away, maybe even from the Kuiper belt itself, and eventually, as it moved closer to the Sun, it might have passed by one of the terrestrial planets, very likely either Venus or Mercury, but maybe even Earth, and this changed its orbit, turning it into this unusual object we have right now. And so until further observations in 2022, it's most likely going to be impossible to tell where this object actually came from. But it definitely seems to be quite unique compared to a lot of other asteroids. Interestingly enough though, this is not the closest asteroid to approach to the Sun. There's an object known as 2005 HC4 that comes even closer to the Sun, the distance of about 0.07 astronomical units. Or about half as close as this. But because this asteroid also goes really far away afterwards, it seems to have the highest speed, highest velocity of any asteroid in the solar system. At the closest approach, it moves at about 157 kilometers per second. And although there are comets that have slightly faster speeds once in a while, from all of the asteroids, this is definitely the fastest. Nevertheless, 2021 PH27 currently holds the record for the smallest semi-major axis, or essentially an asteroid with the shortest orbit around the Sun of about 113 days. Mercury has an orbit of about 88 days. But when it comes to the discovery of this asteroid, there's actually something else I wanted to mention. Something in regards to this unusual type of asteroids that has been hypothetical for almost 100 years now. The type of an asteroid referred to as the Vulcanoids, named after the hypothetical planet Vulcan. Although in this case, the Vulcanoid asteroids do have a potential to exist. They would exist extremely close to the Sun and in a very stable orbit, somewhat similar to the orbit of the asteroid belt, but in this case, enclosed inside Mercury. The thing is, it's extremely difficult to find any of these objects. And though theoretically they can definitely exist and have been proposed to exist by many different scientists, as of today, pretty much every search for these asteroids unfortunately did not return anything. But because of the discovery of this particular asteroid, there's maybe now a chance to potentially discover them after all, simply because this particular asteroid does actually cross the region where these volcanoids are believed to exist. Interestingly, the famous American planet scientist Alan Stern, famous for being the primary investigator of the New Horizons mission to Pluto, has even gone so far as to use the U-2 spy plane that's able to fly extremely high in the upper atmosphere to actually try to discover these objects by looking at them during twilight period. And this was done back in uh, the year 2000. And since then, unfortunately, no volcanoids have been discovered. Even the NASA stereo satellites that are famous for watching the sun pretty much 24-7 have so far been unable to discover anything in that particular orbit. At least nothing large enough, nothing larger than about 5 kilometers in size. There has been at least one study that suggested because of the effects from the Sun, such as the Yarkovsky effect and the pressure from the solar radiation itself, over time a lot of asteroids will probably start spinning really fast and fall apart, creating a lot of smaller pieces orbiting in the region. And so there could still be about a thousand or so smaller rocks, possibly about one kilometer in size, that are just extremely difficult to discover. Or maybe all of this created something similar to the Saturn's rings, something extremely well shredded, really small in size, but once again, very difficult to detect. 
And so by studying these extremely close to the Sun asteroids, we might be able to find the Vulcanoid zone after all. Especially since this definitely passes through it. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this unusual croissant shape. Huh, croissant. I'm getting hungry, I should have eaten something before recording this. Anyway, we're talking about this as a potential shape for what our solar system might look like if you were to look at it from extremely far away distance. But more importantly, we're talking about why it looks like this, because after about a year and a half, the scientists might have finally solved this mystery. The mystery of why the solar system seems to resemble this more so than just this. With the explanation itself, apparently being relatively simple, something that the scientists figured out once they started simulating this using supercomputers. But let's actually start with a discovery from a year and a half ago, in case you don't want to watch that older video that should be popping up somewhere right there at some point in this video. So first of all, here we're not just talking about the solar system that we're sort of familiar with, with the planets and maybe some asteroids, we're talking about the entire solar system that goes even beyond that, even beyond Pluto and beyond some of the most distant objects we've discovered to date. Here we're talking about what we usually refer to as the heliosphere. The shape that's formed by the magnetosphere of the Sun and that represents a kind of an atmospheric layer that emanates from the surface of the Sun formed by the solar wind that spreads to billions of kilometers away from the Sun itself. With the cavity itself being formed by the interaction between the solar wind and the interstellar medium that's found across the entire galaxy in between stars. This interstellar medium, by the way, is mostly made out of different types of hydrogen and a lot of other gas, usually produced by a lot of different supernovae that happen over billions and billions of years. But there's naturally a lot of other interaction, including some of the magnetic interaction that's produced by the galaxy itself. But this bubble is formed in a very similar way to, I guess, a balloon. Here, the solar wind continuously inflates the heliosphere around the sun, and because the Sun is also moving across the galaxy, it also ends up producing this comet-like tail behind it. So that's the basic image of what the heliosphere might look like from a distance and, I guess, from the side. So basically here it shows us the motion of the solar system across the galaxy, plus the effects from the solar wind. And importantly enough, heliosphere is extremely crucial for the protection of the solar system and the planets in the solar system from a lot of different types of extremely powerful radiation, as you can see in the simulation from NASA. In the natural, the heliosphere ends up working as a kind of a shield of the solar system, protecting us from very dangerous cosmic rays, from extremely powerful ionizing radiation, and thus protecting the planets from potentially losing atmosphere and water. But this flow from the solar wind sort of ends abruptly right around here at the termination shock. And this mostly happens because of the kind of a balance that's reached between the pressure from the solar wind and the pressure from the interstellar medium as the solar system travels across the galaxy itself. One of the best ways of simulating this is by using your own sink. Here's what all of this would sort of look like. So here you have this very fast moving water forming a kind of a spherical or circular bubble with the termination shock being represented by this line and the majority of the flow going this way. And so that's sort of the natural of how all of this works. And by the way, using liquids as a kind of a representation of all of this is really important because that's sort of how the scientists solve this mystery as well. But more about this in, I guess, a minute or so. But a lot of these discoveries and a lot of this data only started coming to us approximately eight years ago or about nine years ago, when the Voyager 1 probe crossed the limit itself and started to send different data from what it was sending before. And since now both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes have officially left the heliosphere, this allowed the scientists to first of all start mapping the shape itself, but also discover some unusual mysteries that we've previously covered in some of the previous videos, including a discovery of an unusually hot hydrogen that the scientists have referred to as the hydrogen wall, or the wall of fire as it was referred to. This video from NASA sort of simulates how all this kind of looks like. With the probes now officially traveling in this region between the heliopause and the termination shock, that's usually referred to as the heliosheath. But up until the probes reach this area, a lot of the early assumptions suggested that a lot of this is very likely somewhat spherical in shape, basically sort of resembling a typical cometary shape. As a matter of fact, most of the media from, I guess, a few years ago always presents it in this way. 
But then about a year ago, or more like a year and a half ago, a study came out analyzing some of the data and discovering that, well, it doesn't seem to actually have this shape, or at least doesn't seem to have a perfect shape. As a matter of fact, it was discovered to be very, very unpredictably wrinkly and have a lot of folds, and basically overall resembling something like this. Sort of like a croissant, but I guess even here we're sort of pushing the definition. In other words, it did not have a perfectly cometary or spherical shape and seemed to resemble something a lot more unpredictable. And this was really important because by not having a spherical shape and by having a lot of irregularities and a lot of, I guess, folds and wrinkles and all sorts of stuff in between, including various cracks here, what this suggested is that certain dangerous cosmic rays and certain dangerous cosmic radiation has a chance to potentially go through the heliosphere and thus affect our planet in a way that we didn't really think would be possible before. In other words, by studying these irregularities and figuring out the exact shape of the heliosphere, we might be able to predict how various types of galactic radiation might influence our planet as well. In other words, it relates to the idea of predicting cosmic weather, something that's really important to us today, especially because we have so many different satellites in orbit around planet Earth that are extremely sensitive to various types of radiation. But by being on planet Earth, it's very difficult for us to see what the actual shape looks like and to actually predict what all of this might resemble. And also because we only really have these two probes that have returned data to us, and so building the image of the entire heliosphere is somewhat difficult. Nevertheless, the data here suggested that the sphere is definitely not constant, not spherical, and is a lot more unpredictable than we originally thought. But in order to start their investigation, the scientists decided to actually focus on two very specific features of the Sun that a lot of other stars have that we've only discovered about six years ago. The so-called heliospheric jets. Or two jets emanating from the two poles of the Sun itself. Something that a lot of different stars and a lot of different stellar objects have around the universe. For example, here's what these jets look like from a much more powerful star known as BZ Chem with another example from a more well-known star known as Mira. And notice how these jets eventually form this very long cometary-like tail. And so it's assumed that something very similar is happening around the Sun, but probably to a lesser degree because the Sun is not as active. Now, the existence of these jets isn't really a surprise, though. A lot of different stellar objects usually have some sort of a jet. We normally refer to them as astrophysical jets because they're much more powerful and produce more energy, but even smaller stars like our Sun will have them as well. But just like other jets we've seen, including the galactic jets, these are not particularly stable and will eventually start curving due to the motion across the galaxy and the pressure from the interstellar medium, or basically from a lot of other gas that's around the galaxy which kind of results in this shape. But the main purpose behind the recent paper was really trying to figure out why this cross-sun shape is not particularly perfect either, why it has these instabilities all over the place. Or in other words, why isn't this shape a little bit more well-defined and instead has so much turbulence on the inside? And well, as always, the answer came from models and simulations using a supercomputer. But in this case, the scientists actually discovered this sort of by accident. In this case, their model focused on neutral hydrogen, hydrogen that does not have any charge, whereas the hydrogen coming from our sun is charged. There's a tremendous amount of neutral hydrogen in the interstellar medium, and there's quite a lot of it hitting the solar system at all times as well. And so interestingly, when they only left the ionized hydrogen in their model, removing the neutral hydrogen completely, the actual shape was a lot more perfect and resembled the models we've had before. In other words, it resembles something like this, a lot more perfectly circular and spherical shape. But then when they put the neutral hydrogen back in their model, suddenly the shape became extremely unpredictable, with things bending around, wiggling around, and producing a lot of different instabilities like you see in this image. And this implied only one thing, it's the interaction between neutral hydrogen and the ionized hydrogen, the one coming from the solar wind and from the sun itself, that essentially seems to produce these irregularities and these unusual formations, and thus results in this unusual cross-sun shape and not a perfect sphere. And the explanation here goes back to that image I showed you before. It goes back to liquids and gases. Here, when you have two different gases or two different liquids interacting, they will often result in these shapes we normally refer to as the Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. 
it usually happens because of the differences in density and because of the way that the lighter liquid tends to push into the heavier liquid, producing all sorts of turbulence on the inside. You can actually find the examples of Rayleigh instability in a lot of different liquid interactions, including the famous lava lamp and a lot of other atmospheric conditions or even weather changes. But according to the study, it looks like these instabilities are also responsible for something a little bit larger in scale, the shape of the entire solar system or the heliosphere. And this is a really important discovery because it takes us just a step closer to being able to predict the actual entire shape of the solar system and the heliosphere, which can then help us predict the solar weather or the space weather across the entire solar system. Something that we're still not able to do, but something that the scientists are hoping to achieve sometime in the near future. More importantly, by being able to predict these instabilities and their formations across various parts of the solar system, we might actually be able to predict the total amount of radiation that's going to reach our planet, which can take us a little bit closer to understanding the entire environment of the solar system and how to protect various spacecrafts or various colonies from dangerous cosmic radiation. And the paper itself also makes some predictions about what all this might mean. For example, these instabilities imply that certain cosmic rays might be actually accelerated by this instability and thus end up reaching planet Earth with a lot more energy than they would have otherwise. Their shape and their overall interaction also generally depends on the total density of neutral hydrogen in that particular area of interstellar medium, with the average rate of growth of a typical instability being approximately three years, so these shapes do change pretty frequently. More importantly, it seems that when these instabilities interact with the heliospheric jets, the jets from the sun itself, they tend to result in a magnetic reconnection, which then allows for a lot of different interstellar medium to enter the solar system which in essence is very similar to how our sun produces coronal mass ejections. When the magnetic lines around the sun snap, they end up releasing a tremendous amount of charged particles headed toward various planets. But in this case, something extremely similar happens on the outskirts as well, except this time it sends material inwards. Although in this case, it sends neutral hydrogen and a lot of interstellar medium material. How all of this affects the inner planets is of course not known. These are really interesting discoveries and this is a really interesting explanation, so I'm sure this is just the beginning and we'll be learning more about the heliosphere and the entire shape of the solar system in some of the future studies as well. So I'm definitely looking forward to this and if you are as well, make sure to subscribe and maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. And also maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. And either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.